In many cases, all that is left of a traumatic event is a detail of the environment. The grain of a piece of furniture, the pattern of a wallpaper, or the view from a window. What happened there is unrecordable, and all that remains is a stray element of the scene that may resurface in dreams and nightmares for decades. Aristotle recommended memorizing things in order so that you may access what's in between by remembering the flanking items. But in this instance, just the flanking items can be recalled. This is similar to the frustration of attempting to locate a key passage in a book. All you remember is that it was on the top left of the page, but you can't recall the page number or chapter. Despite being recognized by scientists working in the 1950s and 1960s, Several modern sleep researchers misunderstand this basic principle. It is anticipated that one's early memories will include emotionally charged experiences such as being separated from one's mother or being hit by a car on the street. Experimenters intended to prove that REM sleep helped to separate emotions from memories, allowing us to retain the knowledge while avoiding being crippled by the emotional impact of the experiences. Subjects are placed in an MRI machine and shown visuals that the researchers deem emotional, with cerebral blood oxygenation measured. This type of experiment, which is widespread, overlooks both the reality that people have unique histories, so what is traumatic for one person may not be terrible for another, and the phenomenon of flanking in which little or incidental facts come to stand in for or obscure the more strong recollections. When I listen to people's descriptions of their childhoods, I find that the most common early memories are those with little emotional power, seemingly random incidents or exchanges that, months or years later, reveal their relationship to more significant stuff. Herman Witkin and Helen Lewis were studying the effect of pre-sleep stimuli on dreaming in 1965 and showed their male subjects two films, a graphic record of childbirth in which a vacuum extractor is inserted into a woman's vagina and the blood-soaked gloved hands of an obstetrician are seen pulling on a chain protruding from it, followed by an episiotomy and a horrific documentary about circumcision in which Following the screening of the delivery film, their first subject dreamed of a group of college students in a park, with a group of girls dressed in white and wearing long white gloves. The girls didn't want the boys to see their arms and elbows because bees were pollinating flowers. One of the subjects got a distinct visual of a frog in a pool of water after the third film, as if it was literally before me. This struck a chord with him since he remembered as a boy being nasty to frogs, tossing them across a brick-walled incinerator and murdering them. Another subject dreamed that his mother was telling him about having friends around for supper after seeing the monkey movie, and he was perplexed because he and his mother were the same age. The film's cannibalistic motif and age divide had thus been inverted, much like the spotless white gloves that covered their blood-soaked palimpsest. Following the graphic films, Witkin and Lewis discovered many symbolic connections to impregnation and delivery, and concluded that recalling dreams was more difficult when the pre-sleep aspects were so unpleasant. Symbolization processes were more dense here, making the dreams seem more opaque and resistant to interpretation than those that followed the journey, as if more encryption was required. They also contended, along with other researchers, that a lack of dream reports indicates a failure to recall rather than a failure to dream. And they found that several of their respondents were unable to recognize dreams that they had reported only a few days prior. These tests can reveal more about the experimenters than about the topic matter. Whereas Lewis and Witkin were aware that the impact of an image or a phrase on a person can never be known or predicted in advance. This is no longer the case. Assuming that all humans are the same, visuals that are innately unsettling or pleasurable are posited. A violent scene, on the other hand, can terrify one individual while leaving another unaffected or even excited. What counts is that person's background 
and the positions they've taken in the many scenarios in which they've been involved. Following the overthrow of President Suharto's dictatorship in 1998, advocacy groups in Bali attempted to organize some form of group therapy for victims of the anti-communist purges of the mid-1960s, which resulted in the deaths of between 5% and 8% of the population, as well as the assault and imprisonment of tens of thousands more. The only option was to hire the services of an American business that sold stress reduction techniques to the locals. However, when told to visualize a white sandy beach to obtain inner calm, many individuals found this vision disturbing. After all, they were fishermen, and what the sea meant to them was vastly different than what it might mean to someone living in an American city. How we react to trauma, and what trauma is, varies from person to person just as it has been redefined throughout history. During the American Civil War, irritable heart syndrome was the most common symptom of war trauma. But shell shock was the most common symptom during the First World War. It was war exhaustion in WWII and post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD in Vietnam, which included symptoms such as reliving the event, avoiding stimuli connected with it, numbing of responsiveness, and hyperarousal, which manifested as sleep disturbances and increased vigilance. While such diagnoses may be beneficial to some, others may be unable to get care because their symptoms do not match. According to one estimate, around 75% of those who have experienced trauma during warfare do not exhibit PTSD symptoms, but nonetheless suffer. The way we think about sleep influences how we describe sleep disorders and the way we think about trauma influences how we define categories like PTSD. Whereas in the past, medical attention was focused on physical symptoms. Today's medical attention is increasingly focused on memory and its apparent disruptions. Some of the behaviors connected with this category have been explained using the old theory that REM sleep aids the transfer of everyday experience and memories retained in short-term memory to long-term memory. It is thought that PTSD occurs when trauma is retained in short-term memory, allowing quick triggering and recall via environmental cues. When you hear the doorbell or any other unexpected noise, you are immediately transported back to the battlefield. Traumatic memories must be transferred to another storage system. And sleep, we are taught, is the only way to accomplish this. However, the evidence is compounded by the fact that what is said to be locked in short-term memory, flashbacks and possibly nightmares, is frequently something that did not truly happen to the person. In flashbacks, the experience of being trapped beneath rubble from an explosion, for example, may recur, but they were never actually trapped under rubble. What appears to be perfectly real has not always been experienced. Surprisingly, when Vietnam veterans talk about being kidnapped by aliens, they exhibit more of the physiological responses we associate with stress, such as elevated heart rate, perspiration, and rapid breathing than when they talk about their combat experiences. The issue of trauma is complicated in this case. We frequently discover that the most invasive memories are those that a person has heard about through a friend, acquaintance, or even a television program. When confronted with an excruciating and unimaginable event, it is someone else's recollection that is placed in that spot. It serves as a precursor to something even more terrifying, and the person can wake up terrified for years as a result of this borrowed memory. One of my patients reported an incident in which she was sexually touched by her stepfather when she was a little girl. The details were spot on, and the context and setting were crystal obvious. However, after some thought, she realized that the scene was nearly entirely plagiarized from a close friend who had revealed her own abuse by her stepfather after her parents divorced. This pre-made scene had taken the role of a trauma she had experienced, but which was considerably less accessible with only a few sensory bits. Ronald Reagan's recall of a wartime experience, which he described during his 1980 presidential campaign, 
is a well-known example of such a borrowed memory. He related how a bomber was evacuated after being hit, and how the young gunner at the back of the plane was too badly injured to join the rest of the crew in bailing out. Never mind, Reagan said, tears welling up in his eyes as he recounted the pilot's comments. We'll take it all the way down together. Despite the fact that the plot was based on a 1944 film called A Wing and A Prayer, Reagan's memories had become his own. Certain images, especially those that appear to be possessed of an ultimate beauty, can take the place of something unimaginable and awful, just as a borrowed memory can. In the Battle of the Bulge, Joseph Robertson, a member of the U.S. 30th Infantry, tells how he was sheltering behind a fallen tree and could see German soldiers in the field in front of him. One of them, a little child, was crawling along a ditch right towards him, and Robertson screamed for him to surrender when he was just three feet away. The youngster raised his weapon, but Robertson fired first. He slept that night, but the picture of the blue-eyed, fair-skinned blonde soldier he had killed, so gorgeous, like a tiny angel, tormented him for the rest of his long life. He would still wake up every night crying at what he called the saddest moment of my life. Characterized by this vision of total and heartbreaking beauty more than 50 years later. Like the stolen memory, this image serves as a placeholder, indexing a point of unfathomable horror. Attempting to access this site can be harmful and useless for the person and there are many occasions where marking the location of a trauma is preferable to trying to force it into some type of ready memory or narrative. Circumscribing a trauma differs from trying to remember it. And many literary and creative works demonstrate how an inscription or mark differs from a work of representation. His trauma and memory theories have a lot riding on them. In many countries, Asylum applicants must give a coherent narrative of their experience in order to be granted refugee status. A demand that runs against some of the core features of trauma that we've covered. It is ironic because the police forces of these same countries frequently recognize that when a supposed victim of rape or assault gives the same tale every time, the truthfulness of the account may be called into question. Trauma causes a shattering of subjectivity as well as a rupturing of bodily and psychical boundaries, which results in a story full of contradictions, inconsistencies, and inaccuracies. And, in the face of indescribable suffering, we can draw on the memories and experiences of others. This trauma inquiry can also teach us something about sleep. Clinicians recognize that when painful events begin to appear in dreams, it is a sign of progress indicating that some type of psychical development is occurring. A patient was aware that his parents had divorced when he was three years old, and that it had been a year since he had seen his father. His mother had thrown him and his siblings into the car and driven away without warning or preparation. There were no memories of the family's disintegration, and it had to be pieced together from what an older sibling had told him years later. He remembered his father's gift when they were reunited, but he couldn't recall anything else. He started having dreams about approaching an empty house, which he later recognized as his boyhood home, at a certain point in his investigation. The sensations of emptiness and desolation remained awful, but they were now tied to his past rather than arising out of nowhere in the form of incapacitating depressions in his daily existence. It's fascinating to see how clinical experience contradicts some of the academic studies here, which claims that reduced dream recall is linked to greater social functioning in Vietnam veterans or Holocaust survivors, for example. Of course, this raises the question of how we define adaptation to society which is typically measured in functional terms. Do they have a job? Are they married? Etc. Or in the degree to which the person complains or not about their circumstances. When we hear that Holocaust survivors who don't remember their dreams have a better long-term adaptation than those who do, we would ask how well their children have adapted as well. What is shut out or uninscribed for one generation tends to return with greater vigor for the next. 
or in the shape of often persistent bodily ailments, as physicians found after the war. So, what role does the dream play in this scenario? In many respects, a psychoanalytic response reflects the concepts of early sleep researchers who considered dreaming as a memory operation. However, this is a highly specific type of activity that connects the residues of the day to unconscious trains of thought and fantasies. As one of Freud's students put it, sleep is a type of individual psychotherapy in which the unconscious acts as a reader, evaluating incoming information and assimilating it into pre-existing structures. That is why most people find it difficult to learn from their experiences and why we prefer to spend our lives doing the same things, repeating the same patterns or making the same mistakes whether or not this is a source of sorrow or happiness. Consider the 2015 refugee situation to illustrate this point. Thousands of people died at sea when flimsy and overloaded boats from North Africa and Syria collapsed. But it wasn't until a front page image of a guy on a beach in Turkey clutching a dying infant in his arms appeared. The quick translation of the strange and unappealing refugees into the Christian image of the piano transformed it into a human tragedy, and people instantly cared. It was as though the Christian story had defined and elevated the trauma to a new level. What had been rejected, scorned, and despised had become familiar, and could elicit standard anger responses. We may also conjure up the image of the white gloves from previously. A dreamer had seen a video that was likely unpleasant including explicit portrayals of the opposing sex's genitals and damage detail, that the dream wasn't just rejecting or sanitizing when it inverted the obstetrician's blood-soaked gloves into the lovely white gloves of the park girls. The dreamer recalled afterwards that he had once offered to buy his wife red gloves to match a wedding gown, but she had turned him down. The black gloves he later bought her were misplaced, and his married buddies were thought to be more successful than he was. The treatment of the film's new material was thus shaped by themes of loss, restitution, and failure. And it's possible that this is what the unconscious accomplishes when we sleep, inscribing what's disturbing and new into the frameworks we've built since childhood. When it is unable to do so, we may feel some of the symptoms associated with PTSD though it is important to realize that people who have been through a traumatic event are not obligated to comply to what the current diagnostic requires. It is deciphering and reading if dreaming ties daylight experiences to unconscious complexes. What can't be read traumatizes, occasionally revealing itself with horrifying clarity in NREM. Night terrors and other violent sleep disturbances are common. This would also explain why, while few people enter sleep with REM, with the exception of infants, narcoleptics, and those on particular medications. Traumatized veterans typically exhibit this peculiar twisting of the sleep cycle. Some experts believe that there is a pressure to dream or to try to understand what has torn them apart because REM can occur shortly after sleep begins or its sleep initiation itself. It could also explain why night terrors lessen in later childhood as unconscious fantasies mature. They can absorb experiences and information that previously seemed perplexing and unintelligible, much like filters that mold new material to their own shape. Dreaming, the subject of the connection between dreaming and REM sleep is unavoidable here. Is it too quick to equate the traumatized veteran's rapid REM with dreaming? Dreams and rapid eye movement have been linked for millennia and it had been postulated even before Asarinsky and Claitman's findings that the movements might correspond to the scanning of dream imagery. We reportedly move our eyes in dreams as we follow their narrative, much as we do when awake to gaze at the reality around us. William DeMent, a graduate student, joined Claitman's team to perform studies on these and other dream-related problems, and the preliminary results were promising. The direction and speed of eye movements were taken to imply a scanning process after they were scrutinized so closely. If they shifted their gaze from side to side during REM sleep and subsequently revealed that they had been dreaming about a ping-pong match, this seemed to prove a relationship 
between eye movement and hallucinated images. Ament reported seeing his wife's legs moving vigorously in rattan sleep and her description of a dream in which she was performing a spirited dance when he awoke. The subject's eyes were traveling higher sequentially in another widely cited example. And they then described a dream involving ascending a flight of steps. However, after a few years, most people abandoned their conviction in a link between eye movements and dream visualization. Despite the luck of the ping pong and stairs dreams, matching reports were sometimes difficult to come by. And the fact that infants Perturbed babies and those born blind experienced extended REM periods seemed to dispute or undermine the theory that they were scanning a visual experience. In certain cases, the forceful and constant bending of eyeballs makes any viewing experience difficult to accept. In certain situations, eyeballs are also difficult to reconcile with any seeing experience we would have during the day. Similarly, groups of puppies raised in darkness and subjected to light Dark cycles showed similar REM activity, implying an endogenous program. Some experts believed that the quick movements were either the product of random neuronal activity or of some other process, such as a neurological checkup to prepare the infant for future learning. Indeed, baby's strong REM activity is frequently interpreted as an activation process for the fledgling nervous system, boosting brain growth and adaptability before more diversified sensory experiences become available. Another major flaw in the scanning concept had been clear from the outset, but had gone unreported. Eye movements during REM are connected with back and forth or ascending scanning motions of eyes in the waking state, as in the ping pong or stairs instances. If there isn't a match, the eye movements aren't consistent with the dream. But the misconception here is that if you watch someone's eyes during a ping pong match or when they're awake and walking upstairs, they don't move from side to side or up and down. They only do it in cartoons as we move our eyes in many different directions during such tasks in real life. Ament, who was previously enthralled by the scanning idea, would forsake it a few years later despite the fact that the process of questioning it yielded some intriguing discoveries. Susan Weiner and Howard A. Lichman discovered that when someone is trying to decipher the meaning of a proverb, their eye movements become much faster than when they are scanning a visual image. Another team discovered that even if quick eye movement did not connect with following dream imagery, it increased significantly when the person was not scanning but rather suppressing one. In this view, REM could be associated with the effort to make meaning of or not see anything, rather than with basic sensory tracking. Indeed, it is well knowledge that if you are overcome with worry, you may try to focus visually on an external item to help you get through the situation. During a night out in the West End, a patient recalled how an acute feeling of discomfort, and then terror began to overcome him. He left his pals with no idea what to do or where to go until he passed a cinema and noticed the title of one of the films, Never Let Me Go, which he thought was significant. He stepped in and tried to examine every aspect of the screen, as if he were viewing a painting at the National Gallery during the movie. Only this constant and tedious scanning effort was able to calm the nerves. The eye movements here are an indicator of what he was avoiding rather than what he was looking at. We might ask if this is one of the reasons why people binge watch television to keep anxiety at bay. We focus visually on a screen. What other link could there be between REM and dreaming if the scanning hypothesis was disproven? The obvious link was the remembering of dreams. Ament and Claytman's early experiment indicated that 79% of REM sleep awakenings were followed by dream recollection, compared to only 7% of NREM sleep awakenings, while another study soon found 85% and 0% recall, respectively. This seems to be an interesting discovery, confirming the distinction between REM and NREM sleep. The only issue was that it wasn't quite as tidy. Many researchers dismissed NREM awakenings as mentation rather than dreaming, claiming that the information was clearer, shorter, more conceptual, less visual, 
more ordinary, less story-like, and more realistic. However, this was also questioned. Other sleep labs discovered that a large number of NREN dream reports did not meet these requirements. In terms of recall frequency, tests in which a bogus report from a well-known sleep investigator was published claiming that a medicine had been discovered to boost NREM recollection did indeed have this effect. Dream memory was also found to be influenced by the experimenter's sex and financial incentives may be used to encourage people to recall more dreams. Reading article after paper, we observe researchers either trying desperately to keep REM and NREM apart or recognizing parallels, a reality that may reflect the personal preferences of those involved. Not long ago, a new hypothesis of NREM dreaming proposed that it was caused by covert REM activity occurring behind the scenes against a backdrop of atypical physiology, which effectively meant brain activity that couldn't be neatly divided into sleep stages. Traditional sleep stage scoring procedures, which are focused on separations, were shown to be ineffective during transitional phases. According to some studies, instead of challenging the core paradigm of scoring, and separating. It was a covert manner of retaining the REM, NREM binary, with REM being associated with dreaming sleep. Similarly, dream recall after NREM has been explained as the recall of dreams from previous REM phases, but never the other way around. Other variables were also important in this case. According to one study, soft waking produced more thought-like content while sudden waking created more dream-like information. But perhaps what was going on here was a redefinition of what it meant to dream rather than the discovery of a true difference. I organized a dream conference a few years ago, bringing together physicians and artists. A neuroscientist made some observations at the opening of the panel discussion that highlighted this transition quite clearly. He chose out a few well-known Dal paintings as dreamy ignoring the full sequence of other images shown that day, which were in fact inspired by nighttime dreaming. A dream in this sanitization was something strange, unusual and irrational, full of dazzling colors and inconceivable events. A fact, some dreams may appear to be like this, but there are plenty that aren't, and equating dreams solely with surrealist fantasies is counterproductive. Even the notion that a dream must be visual is debatable. A dream had scarcely neared my ear when it fled affrighted, startled by a marrow freezing incident enough. I was impressed by Charlotte Bront's portrayal of her character sitting up anxiously at night when I first read Jane Eyre many years ago. Although the novel makes numerous references to Jane's dreams having a visual element, this one is unmistakably oral. Indeed, early sleep researchers were intrigued by middle ear muscle activity, particularly during REM sleep, because it appeared to function as if it were listening in the waking state. This was found in about 85% of REM cases, as well as just before it. Even more than eye movements, contractions of these ear muscles have been recommended as a more reliable sign of REM sleep. Although Claypman and Dement initially thought that rapid eye movements were the criterion for dreaming, they later claimed that it was eeg tracings, not eye movements. There are always counterexamples to generalizations concerning the differences between NREM and REM recollection, and practically all research fail because they do not give enough weight to the heterogeneity of individual dreamers. Even hard and fast rules governing the sequencing of REM and NREM aren't always followed, as Claytman discovered when he didn't have a REM period, when his sleep stage data predicted it with confidence. Rather than dismissing NREM dreaming as the poor relative of REM, we can speculate that it is part of a larger process that will eventually lead to REM. Material from NREM and REM awakenings on the same night often show a similar motif, addressed from different angles and in different ways. As several studies have shown, subjects were hypnotized and asked to describe their dreams while they were occurring in one experiment. The majority of them succeeded, and when the accounts supplied during sleep and those extracted after they awoke were compared, 
they tended to line up fairly well. If this meant that the dreams that were remembered were truly the dreams that had been told while sleeping, the surprise was that there were no rapid eye movements at any point during the narration. The dreams seemed to have come from somewhere else. David Falk set out to discover where REM dreams began in his well-known study on sleep and dreams. However, as he moved his awakenings further away from REM, he discovered that dream recall did not stop. He abandoned the notion that dreaming began in REM and instead saw it as a continuous process that occurred throughout the night. Later studies discovered that even stage 4 NREM, which was formerly thought to be the deepest and most recall-resistant phase of NREM, produced a large number of dreams similar to those linked with REM. This consistency suggests that a nighttime dream work is taking place, perhaps a reading process, as we stated previously, in which upsetting and unexpected components are related to unconscious themes and motifs. What we think of as a localized dream could actually be a segment of a much larger sequence. This leads us back to the topic of REM versus NREM sleep. In the sleep cycle, NREM almost always comes before REM, and its timing appears to be influenced by the amount of NREM that has come before it. Should we consider REM to be a treatment or elaboration of what is being processed in NREM, an attempt to save NREM, or a momentary failure to keep an REM alive. Is REM, in other words, a breakdown of another state or process, a repair mechanism, or a logical progression of this in and of itself? These questions could be inverted if we look at things from a developmental perspective, where it has been suggested that REM is more basic than NREM, which appears later in the newborn's life. And REM might then be an attempt to remedy the unsettling aspects of REM sleep that eventually arise. We could only stay in NREM for a short time, one or two hours, implying that it is tough for us to maintain. Sleep is undoubtedly a cyclical process, with four or five cycles of emergence from NREM to a stage resembling our original drowsiness. Things must become more active during REM for at least 10 minutes before the silence may be restored. But the transition to REM is frequently disrupted. Although NREM sleep is commonly referred to be silent, it's likely that its deep, slow waves have been misconstrued. GSR storms, Bouts of sustained and severe arousal signaled by electrodermal activity have been discovered by several researchers during NREM. Similarly, childhood and adulthood night terrors develop only from stage 4 NREM, making the highly symbolic dream products associated with REM look benign in comparison. The night terror becomes more intense the longer and deeper the slow wave NREM sleep is. This could also mean that, Despite the rapid eye movements, respiration, and heart accelerations, REM is the quieter sleep. And REM sleep psychical activity is considerably harder to recall than REM sleeps, which is one of the reasons why many academics feel there was just less of it. When people awaken from NREM sleep, they often have no recollection of what they said or even that they were awake. Whereas when people awaken from REM sleep, they may recall dreams and snippets of speech. This could indicate that NREM sleep has more to hide and that it operates at intensities that would be difficult to bear if made conscious. The relationship between physiological arousal indications and what we would think is going on psychically is quite complicated and there are no simple answers. It would seem logical to associate fast, erratic breathing, elevated pulse rate, and perspiration with someone tossing and turning frantically in their sleep and waking up to recount a nightmare. However, there are well-documented cases where the worst nightmare happens amid a physiological calm. A lying on a ballistic cardiograph table, a doctor fell asleep and awoke after a few minutes from a nightmare in which his brakes failed while parking his automobile. As he anxiously tried to reach for the emergency brake, the automobile careened down a driveway towards his house. His anxiousness and palpitations were severe, but his blood pressure, heart rate, 
and ballistic cardiogram revealed no changes. Only a slight twitch in his left hand was captured on film. We often associate anxiety with physical changes like perspiration and a faster heart rate, but it appears to be separate from its physiology in this case. The REM and REM debate is inextricably tied to the role of the body and its musculature. Surprisingly, Claytman, Asarinsky, and Dement's early studies always emphasized the importance of physical movement in REM versus its absence in NREM. High motility times were associated with peaks of overt body activity in every case. The first two scientists reported. Later definitions of REM sleep claim that the body is more or less paralyzed, with the exception of involuntary muscles utilized for essential activities like breathing. Although muscle tone reduces dramatically in REM sleep and certain reflex reactions are lost, an increase in arm muscle voltage was once thought to be a marker of dreaming, and REM sleep has more minor body movements than other sleep stages. Larger movements are also possible, and they were originally thought to represent scene shifts in dreams. The general concept was that lower muscular tone stopped people from acting out their dreams as if the dream itself demanded movement restraint. It's worth noting that with narcolepsy, a disorder characterized by excessive daytime sleepiness, there can be a comparable loss of muscle tone, known as cataplexy, which occurs frequently during emotional situations such as entering an argument, initiating intercourse, or lifting one's arm to strike a child. Even if the person is awake, the body may slump and collapse dramatically, like a puppet with all the strings gone, as one patient described it. If it is true that people with narcolepsy commonly enter sleep with REM, as has been stated, this would suggest that REM does indeed include some form of muscular shutting down that would allow a distressing or inappropriate impulse to play out. Any approach to these questions would also have to explain why the first and shortest REM period of the night is frequently missed. And why, if it does occur, it can be interspersed with brief periods of NREM with spindles or transitory waking before the next phase, which could be an hour and a half later. It has even been suggested that each REM phase throughout a night's sleep may have different purposes, because they are physiologically distinct. Many of the symptoms linked with REM such as erratic pulse and respiration and genital erection or engorgement appear to start right before it, implying that NREM is breaking up and can no longer be sustained without REM treatment. A theory that narcoleptic superimposition of REM onto waking experiences at times of great emotion functions as a form of treatment or effort at processing as well as the argument that bad sleepers spend less time in REM, may chime in with this. In one investigation, a sleep researcher recalled waking up from a dream with the realization that he had grasped the distinction between REM and NREM sleep. In a dimly lit room, he spoke with the director of his sleep lab. He felt threatened after being accused of stealing some documents. He dashed out the door and ran through the building until he discovered a safe haven where he was surrounded by others who shared his viewpoints. A dangerous zone was on the other side of the area, where his boss's henchmen hovered menacingly. Three zones seemed to be clearly delineated to him. When I asked him which space was the REM, and which was the NREM, his initial response was that the REM was the safe, intermediate zone, and the NREM was the dark, scary spaces but he changed his opinion by his next session. Dreams according to Sigmund Freud. The elements that disrupt our sleep, according to Freud, are the same as those that cause us to dream. What disrupts or obstructs our sleep may become obvious if we can comprehend the reasons of dreams. The main premise of Sigmund Freud's dream theory is frequently misinterpreted or caricatured. There are numerous layers to thinking, and in addition to our conscious considerations, we have preconscious and unconscious processes at work all the time. Thoughts that are preconscious have the potential to become conscious, 
although unconscious trains of thought rarely do. Some of these will be generated as a result of their removal from consciousness, which will be prompted in part by their conflict with other ideas. We can only infer their presence from nightmares, symptoms, slips of the tongue, mistakes, and glitches, and they will congregate around motifs of sexuality and violence. Now, like everyone else, Sigmund Freud recognized that our dreams frequently seem to center around troubles and problems that we encountered the day before. However, he claimed that outward looks are misleading in this case. When we dream, an unconscious train of thought will latch onto the preconscious one, sneaking in like a stowaway or a hitchhiker. The preconscious thoughts here could be on things we haven't done adequately or are about to do and are afraid about. An exam, a dentist visit, some work intrigue, our care for a loved one, or emails we haven't responded to. We might then have a dream about taking the exam or going to the dentist, which supports Freud's thesis that a dream is the fulfillment of a wish to quick readers of his work, or, more often, those who have never bothered to read him. We perform well in the examination, and the dental work is painless, among other things. The fact that so many dreams, on the other hand, Depict a failed exam or a gory tooth extraction is sometimes misinterpreted as a refutation of Freud's theory, although this is precisely what Freud's theory is based on. Extraction is therefore interpreted as refuting Freud's theory, which he does not claim. The dream can elaborate any preconscious concept, but the key is the unconscious thinking that hides alongside it camouflage to evade psychical censorship. Sleep, according to Freud, lowers internal censoring, allowing unconscious components to emerge. Secondary revision, which gives a false coherence or glossing to breaks and fractures, will be used to create a dream work. Because disguise is so important in dream building, the critical features are frequently the most subtle. The dentist's chair, the light, the exam desk. His details will lead to the unconscious material smuggled into the dream. There is consequently a difference between the dream wish and the dream desire. The desire must be deduced from the dreamer's associations. Almost all investigations evaluating Freudian dream theory neglect the reality that these will be completely unique, generated in each person's unique background. Ansel Keys researched the impact of protracted fasting on his volunteers during WWII and found no increase in food and drink dreams. Later studies would use this technique, depriving people of drink to see if dreams involving satisfying thirst increased. The error is to mix up the conscious and unconscious desires for fluids, whatever it might be, depending on the individual. Freud may have aided this error with his famous anchovy-induced dream in the interpretation of dreams. He claims that if he consumes anchovies or highly salted food late as night, he will dream of gulping down water. Drunkenness is a need to quench one's thirst, according to Freud. This often referenced passage appears in a chapter before Freud presents his dream theory, which contradicts his own explanation, according to a more comprehensive hypothesis. The urge to drink water was fulfilled as an alibi to distract attention from unconscious desire, indexed in the dream by a minor detail of the vessel used to drink. But this yearning is elusive. It's not like saying I want to drink water or I want to murder my siblings. Often, the desire that analysis seeks is found in the pauses between sentences because the individual in question could never properly assume or describe it. They couldn't really think. A simple dream might hide this dimension. Ahmed recalls entering his daughter's room when she was under two and noticing her Ren sleep. Pick me, she yelled, choose. When he woke her, she said, oh daddy, I was a flower. The idea here is not so much that a flower may be picked, but that pick me could also mean choose me. The innocent flower dream may have concealed the unconscious motif of being selected over her sister or one of her parents. This is a common theme in mythology and folklore. A successful mission promises to change the sail of the ship, like in the story of Theseus and the Minotaur. 
that after slaying the beast, he forgets his word, and his father jumps from a cliff. Spotting the ship's old sail, a son willfully murders a non-human non-kin, and a son accidentally kills a human kin. Freudian desire is analogous to the relation between these words, where we could hypothesize the deliberate wish to kill human kin. For example, in Little Red Riding Hood, her mother warns her not to converse to strangers while visiting her grandmother. Disobedient to the wolf, she avoids the woodcutter who will save her. A daughter disobeys a prohibition by talking to a harmful non-human, and a daughter obeys a ban by not talking to a safe human. We can infer a deadly yearning between a girl and an older man. Contradictions and inconsistencies between them are where desire lies, not in a meaningful declarative assertion. A dream is a solution to a problem, rearranging material around an impossibility. This could be driven by desire, traumatic memories, or both. It may often interpret a relationship, revealing how we relate to others and how they relate to us. A dreamer's dream wishes can only be equated to an amalgamation of two independent people linked by some crucial common aspect. Freud writes in The Interpretation of Dreams, what may satisfy one causes anguish in another. Dreams typically reflect an unconscious yearning of some other, usually parental, to absorb, fetishize, feed, swallow, annihilate, undermine, pleasure, or abandon us. A dream can either express and explain this need, causing fear and worry, or suggest a shift in our relationship to it, causing relief or separation. During a difficult time, a woman dreamed that her father was throwing a ball from a balcony, but he didn't care because it could hurt anyone below. She recalled a situation from years ago where a massage therapist told her that her neck problem was caused by the fear of being wounded. The therapist suggested picturing the discomfort as a floating ball. In the dream, she realized her father could injure people and didn't care. He threw the ball back down if it needed to float. The dream was thus a window into her father's relationship with her and a commentary on her current predicament. The man she waited for only added to her misery. And like many dreams, this one was self-interpreting. As the dreamer realized, an interesting series of dreams followed that portrayed different ways she could improve her situation, awkwardly waiting for others to return. She set out to find them and inquire about their absence. How far we have come from the anchovy narrative, or indeed from Freud's countless reductions. For example, Matthew Walker recently debunked Freudian psychoanalysis by asking a student to describe a dream. He then looks passionately and knowingly at the student, nodding, and says, I know precisely what your dream is about. Your dream is about time, and specifically about not having enough time to achieve the things you really want to do in life. The student in class are convinced, so he tells them he interprets dreams the same way. To some, this proves Freudian dream theory wrong. What's at risk here? The theatrics just allows a lecturer to assert his supremacy over his students. In this sense, the experiment reveals how suggestion and authority may act in human communities. And like analysis, where the patient is helped in groups, this is the reverse of analysis, where the patient is helped to realize they know and the analyst relinquishes any knowledge or expertise. So there are no experts in psychoanalysis, only a motley crew of misfits hoping not to impress but rather to learn from their patients. After the interpretation of dreams, 1899, Freud's subsequent writings tended to explore the issue of dream handling rather than dream interpretation. He wanted to dampen some of his students' enthusiasm for dream interpretation and to dispel what he called exaggerated regard for them. To do their job effectively, analysts had to let go of their desire to unearth some blinding insight in dreams. He said that a dream could never be fully understood, and that there were no universal standards for dream interpretation. It all depends on each person's interpretation of their dreams. There is a big distinction between dream meaning and dream function. Initially, Freud felt that dreams exist to save sleep. Problems from everyday life will be part of the dream, and unconscious thought trains will connect with them, 
albeit in disguised form, since the repressed does not obey the desire to sleep. A complicated operation is required to keep us awake. Freud maintained that the internal variables are censored because they are dangerous to us. A dream is constructed through disguise and encryption. A man in analysis awoke from sleep with only one clear vision of a lemon. In spite of his girlfriend's protests, he had tried to make her vagina contract by squirting lemon juice inside it when he was five years old. The Spartan dream image has diminished and replaced the motifs of scopic, sadistic, or masochistic pleasure. Remember that by censorship, Freud does not mean a little fellow who sits in your skull and chooses what can and cannot be permitted into consciousness. That which can be thought results in a structural process, like compression. In this case, it is difficult to avoid adding a thinker, and therefore the idea that someone must determine what can be thought and what cannot. But psychic censoring is distinct. To build the notion I am loving seeing this act of sexual aggression, or a woman is punished for her sexual enjoyment. The image of the lemon was constructed instead. This question is likely most acute for us while we are falling asleep. Dreamwork may encrypt our thoughts and send them in frightening paths. A man was mortified to reveal that a split second image of touching his mother's naked body was in his thoughts, followed by a baked dish of sweet potatoes and mussels. It's two things that shouldn't be together, he added encapsulating the Oedipal longing elegantly and precisely. And he couldn't make sense of anything at first indicates that censoring was operating well. The ciphering would have failed if the meaning was clear. According to the image, sweet potatoes and mussels both have links to childhood memories and the male and female bodies. Noticing how the thought itself did not wake him up, we may ask how such sequences can occur. It's hard to grasp the connections between the sections of the brain process here. Thus, I think this is the most obscure and least studied region of sleep. We may recall an image or a concept if we are awakened, but the transition between elements is difficult to grasp. Introspection is restricted and forgetting is rapid. But if we're about to fall asleep, the opacity of the connection must be part of the process. For example, a lady awoken by a plain seatbelt announcement could recall the psychical sequence that occurred in the single second she drifted off. It reminded her of the many times she had chastised her mother for revealing her nude body, and how similar her father's charge was, followed by the vision of a city plan. The city was viewed from above, with a sort of statue or pillar that I knew was my mother, and I knew was my father. The maternal statuary was modest and secluded in relation to the much larger paternal region. The sequence is noteworthy because it transforms an idea into a visual image that, if she hadn't been awakened, would have been forgotten or absorbed in a dream. It might have been difficult to interpret without knowing the earlier thought's relationship to the image. The initial concept was plainly worrisome and had only come up during an analytic session that day. The visual image distorted the notion beyond recognition. If the risk of permitting such thoughts appears too high, the encryption's speed may save us. But the risk is sometimes too large. We can't sleep if the disturbing aspects are too strong or too present, says Freud. Instead of deception, we pick insomnia. We awaken from sleep. Unconsciousness, or what cannot be absorbed within it is experienced as anxiety and most individuals are familiar with this feeling of waking up in the middle of the night in fear or terror. Freud adds that for some, sleeplessness is a deliberate state, as falling asleep exposes them to the risks of weakened sensory. Instead of waking, they may fail to fall asleep. What keeps us awake is also what wakes us up, the most alarming unconscious thoughts. Many well-meaning insomnia therapies make the error of conflating preconscious and unconscious thoughts. The unconscious, or what cannot be assimilated to it, is merely using day-to-day -day difficulties to find expression. So treating daily worries and helping the person relax may have therapeutic value, but not fundamentally affect sleep troubles. Of course, this doesn't help because unconscious content is tough to access 
and change. Take a look at an example from Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams to see how these parts interact. A father had been caring for his sick child all day. Soon after, he moved into the next room to rest, leaving the door open to view the child's body surrounded by tall candles. An elderly man sat by the body, saying prayers. In this setting, the father slept and dreamed the following. Father, don't you see I'm burning? His child scolded him from beside his bed. He awoke to a glow from the next room. The old man was asleep, and a candle had fallen on one of the child's arms, burning it. On one level, says Freud, the dream is explicable. A glare of light awoke the dozing father that a candle had fallen. So he awoke to the dreadful scene. In between sight of the glare and consciousness of the fire, there was a dream. The glare was woven into the dream without waking him awake. And this is where the unconscious element of the dream is located. This point of reprimand, presumably tied to a father's guilt towards his kid, is suggested by Lacan in his interpretation of the dream. Father, don't you see I'm burning? Invokes the son's perpetual reproach to the father for failing him. Despite the lack of information about the dreamer and his son, it reveals two distinct levels of the dream. The manifest and more visible level that concerns the dreamer's actual situation, and the hidden, unconscious level that involves feelings and thoughts that the dreamer may never fully comprehend or bear consciously. So why did the dreamer wake up when he felt the glare from across the room? Other wishes arising from the repressed undoubtedly elude us, as we don't know any more about the situation. It may be linked to the chance provided by the accident. Had this had been a method for him to express his remorse and pain at the sun grabbing his arm in the dream, the glare will not cause you to wake up, but the intensity and unbearability of the pain will. A psychical stimulus trumps the sensory. Consider the shocking conclusion of Brian De Palma's 1976 film Carrie. After a murderous rampage, the student kills her own mother before setting herself herself in their home. Sue, a victim of Carrie's bullying, pays her respects at her grave. In the dream, a hand shoots up from the ground and grabs her as she puts them there. Sue awakens, and we realize it was all a dream but one that contains something more real than her actual reality, a materialization of her friend's deadly claim on her, and the point of guilt beyond it. During the First World War, shell-shocked troops would intentionally lie awake to prevent nightmares that would relive their agony. All films like Carrie exploit this to create a twist. It is the basis of the nightmare on Elm Street series, in which the supernatural murderer Freddy kills characters in their dreams, so he can only be found and defeated within those same dreams. The stakes of life and death are thus closer to us than any shared exterior reality. Any philosophical ideas regarding the blurring boundaries between sleep and wakefulness are not just imprecise metaphors. Many of the physiologically oriented sleep researchers of the 1950s and 1960s attempted to show the psychoanalyst Lawrence Kuby's remark that we are never really awake or asleep. According to Kuby, the distinction between sleeping and waking is relative, with parts of us asleep while we are awake, and awake when we are asleep. Following the discovery of REM sleep cycles, various claims were made that the same cycles occur during awake hours and that EEG patterns do not always allow for such clear distinctions. While many of these claims are improbable, the idea that we are always awake is plausible. Others can wake up to their child's cries, whereas fathers can wake up to the buzzing of their phones. Interns would wake up to the tannoy sound pattern 1,123 for, but not 1,123 or 1,123 45. While it is possible to sleep with one's eyes open, we always sleep with our ears open. And like in the lab, sleep researchers might see mathematician Norbert Wiener snoring and sleeping on conference panels, only to wake up and make highly relevant comments. Discussion. The distinctions between awake and sleeping are not always as clear-cut as we'd like. In reality, a precise definition of awakeness is difficult to come by. 
Opening one's eyes isn't a candidate because it might occur during sleep or other states of unconsciousness. In one experiment, a sleeping subject was awakened by a researcher waving his hand in front of his eyes. Testing revealed that most people do not have attention or contact with reality. Important cues were neglected and thoughts wandered in odd areas, mingling freely with fantasy material. Doctors revealed their true cognitive processes while listening to a scientific presentation, which seemed at odds with being awake. He died and his soul flew through the keyhole with a loud whistling noise. He levitated and hovered over the table, shocking everyone in the room, and a portrait's head and upper body came to life. Similarly, paying attention is not identical with being awake, as we may do it to avoid pain and worry. When we are overwhelmed or anxious, we tend to devote attention to something, whether it is work-related or leisure-related. A brochure at the back of an airplane seat often suggests focusing on an object in the cabin to overcome sickness or fear. In this sense, attentiveness is more like a form of defense, perhaps against the same unpleasant factors that keep us awake at night. Similarly, the idea that we are continually sleeping until awoken by severe events is appealing. Rhythmic and monotonous activities like slow dancing to traditional bands can indicate an eag of light sleep. Sleep researcher Ian Oswald went about Edinburgh for a long time with two volunteers on either side of him, with their eyes closed and in a condition of sleep. Today's youth talk about being woke to issues and challenges, as if being sleeping is the norm. Lacken believed that the parent who dreamed of his child burning just awoke to continue sleeping. Contrast this with Viktor Frankl's account of his concentration camp nightmare in his formerly popular book Man's Search for Meaning. He remembers seeing another prisoner squirm around in his sleep at Auschwitz. Frankl drew back the hand that was about to shake him. The horror of the camp to which he would awaken, he believed, would be worse than any human reverie. He abandoned him to his dreams, language, and sleep. We've seen how unsettling aspects can both wake us up and keep us awake, but it nearly always goes against our will. To be unable to sleep can be a terrible conflict. Insomniacs know that the wish itself can disrupt sleep. The desire to sleep itself is a form of self-hypnosis, and the association of sleep with hypnosis was formerly widespread. In public hypnotism shows, the patient is often told, now you are going into a deep sleep. The paradox is clear. For sleeping, we must separate attention from ideas and wishes. Sleeping becomes increasingly difficult as we attempt harder. We cannot resist believing that the very anxiety to sleep is one of the primary causes of insomnia, said Dickens. Lee Scrivener describes this circular pattern well in his History of Insomnia, where the desire to sleep eventually obstructs sleep. So, despite the monotony and repetition supposed to comfort us, the many insomnia therapies that urge us to think about something, a sandy beach, an empty white room, risk causing us to stay awake. Scrivener argues insomnia's therapy is its cause. The more I court it, the more it flies me, said poet John Suckling about sleep. In many circumstances, sleep becomes the target of desire not because it is intrinsically valuable, but because it is unreachable. As the person longs for sleep week after week, month after month, everything seems to revolve around it, including appointments to doctors or therapists. In the crystallized sleep, the person anticipates. As a result of this anxiety, the person scrutinizes himself anxiously as he lies down the night before, counting the hours he has slept. Insomnia becomes a form of desire, which makes it much more difficult to shift. It has to be replaced, which is why love is often helpful. Another apparent paradox is that the desire to sleep can keep us awake. The inability to switch off our thoughts while lying awake at night shows that thoughts must be suppressed in some way in order to sleep. When we examine closely, we see that the thoughts here have a linguistic form, but in many cases, it is precisely words that are required to induce sleep. In his Anatomy of Melancholy, Robert Burton advised to read some pleasant author until he be asleep, 
An American physician, Joseph Collins, concludes his popular 1912 book, Sleep in the Sleepless, with a chapter on reading as a soporific. Pointing out that books are the most common instrument insomniacs use to purge the mind of the troubling thoughts, he describes books as an opium, and each reader must select the correct book to displace vagrant, demanding, and tormenting ideas. What insomniac adds, I have to get out of my own head in order to sleep. And books are the only way. Books provide an escape from what would otherwise keep us up, just as they do for children who ask for a bedtime story. However, only a few decades after Collins' advice was written, publishers were lamenting that as effective sleeping medications became more widely available, fiction sales were declining. What could make it so simple for a medication to replace language? What role do words play in our sleep transition? Bedtime stories are craftily constructed to raise a level of worry just to pacify you just before uneasiness has settled in. According to psychoanalyst Vincent Dackey, the narrative tension distracts us from the much more terrible prospect of sleep and what it entails while also preparing us for it. Love, separation, and death to name a few obvious topics and motifs, can all be addressed in bedtime books. Is there something more that affects us here and helps us fall asleep? Aside from the actual content of such stories, is it possible to be transported from our own thoughts to another space simply by reading someone else's words? Is it necessary to be able to differentiate our own tale from that of another? Falling asleep, according to Sigmund Freud, is about changing our relationship with stimuli, not merely removing them, drawing the curtains, turning down the lights, disrobing, and filtering out noise are all removals of stimuli on one level, but they may also be symbols of this process. Metaphors for a transition to another state and the act of withdrawal, as anyone who has lived near a busy road or fallen asleep with the lights on knows. Sleep is fully capable of occurring when these stimuli are still there. Dreams are skilled at combining the same things that should be waking us awake. So one of the requirements of sleep is the limitation of our interest in sensory inputs rather than their absence. However, how can we alter our response to stimuli in the way that they address us? Mobile phones and screens of all kinds encapsulate an ever-present demand in everyday life. Messages, queries, communications, and imperatives are constantly coming our us. They interpel us in whatever form they take, forcing us to respond. And it's a feature of all human communication. The referential, emotional, and kinetic roles of language have historically been studied in linguistics. The referential dealt with how words related to objects and conveyed meaning. The emotional with the speaker's relationship to their words and the expressive side of language, and the canative with one's addressee, such as ordering or inquiring. Surprisingly, these fields of research overlook the actual experience of being spoken to, which is, after all, our situation from birth. We are talked to and about even while we are still in the womb. However, if we are addressed practically without remission as soon as we enter the world, we will have very little time to create a response until we establish a system and rhythm of communication with our caregivers. Any components of our early dependency can be defended against, such as being fed or being forced to do things. But defending against the basic feeling of being addressed is considerably more difficult. It can be seen in its most basic manifestations in the hallucinatory experiences described by some psychotic patients when they believe a voice or a sight is speaking directly to them, even if they are oblivious of the message's content. It's also possible that this is a major source of torture, despite the fact that everyone is aware of the concentration camp's horrifying physical circumstances and customs. Survivors recall the extreme misery of the Nazis near constant interpellation activities, roll calls, name checks, and inspections all centered on the inmates' vocal calling, even if it was obvious that the interpolation would not result in death. It was always a stab in the heart. 
Perhaps it is this very specific quality of language that we discover on the outskirts of sleep. Teddy bears and scraps of fabric, on the other hand, have drawn more sleep borders. Although teddy bears and scraps of fabric have received greater attention as bedtime soothers, words are just as vital. Ruth Weir placed a tape recorder next to her too and a half-year-old son Anthony's bed in a groundbreaking study in the early 1960s. In many ways, the crib speech she studied was surprising. It was full of imperatives, as if he was conversing with someone else while also appropriating commands and instructions he had received earlier in the day. We believed that these ostensibly monologues were actually dialogues, as though Anthony was always addressing himself and his cuddly toy Bobo, who had little meaning for him otherwise. Anthony was learning to internalize communication, figuring out how to use the words that had previously been directed at him. He could now construct dialogues using crib speech, even though he was their only addressee. Isn't this just what we need to be able to sleep at night? When we're lying awake at night, anxious to sleep but unable to do so, it's possible that this feature of language is to blame. We can't turn off the function of being addressed, interrogated, or beckoned in some way. We can comprehend Freud's statement that we sleep because we can't tolerate the external world uninterruptedly. In the sense of continuous interpolation, the lack of an off switch. Although the content of our thoughts is definitely essential here, the fight we had at work, the assignment we didn't do, the health of a loved one, the email we didn't send. It is the grasp of the thoughts as a whole that we can't break. Mobile phones, tablets, and laptop computers that may be near our bedside merely add to this interpolation. This leads us back to the original question of why bedtime stories work so well. The key to the bedtime story, according to Dutch philosopher Jan Linskoten, is that we are not required to respond to it. A narrative asks us to do nothing except listen, which distinguishes it from so many other speaking encounters we have in our daily lives. We are continuously expected to respond, answer, and comply. But finally, something different has arrived. And like the commands, orders, and requests that our caregivers issue, which are later reflected in the emails, texts and instructions that we receive on a daily basis. Here is a place where we do not have to take up a position. It's as though the addressee function has been disabled or suspended indefinitely. Another weird nocturnal phenomenon mirrors this element of the bedtime narrative. If we are startled awake while falling asleep, we may be left with a very intense visual image, a word, or a sentence. One sleep researcher awoke to the Joycean sentence, or squans of medication allow me to ungather, while another was awakened by the crisp phrase analytical geometry in three dimensions. His works are frequently poetic. The conflict stands in red lines, or I think like water in sapphire. For example, may appear to make no sense at first glance, but are semantically highly deep and find that all with syphilis is instantly, or they are exposed to verbally interjection are examples of compressed and disjunctive grammar that aren't usually followed. Such encounters have been well documented and studied. And one thing they all have in common is that the person is frequently left with a strong sense of the significance of the image or phrase. It is felt to have some weight of significance, however enigmatic it appears to be. The elliptical words or image, like a vector of meaning, interpellate them in a direct way. Even if we don't understand what these hypnagogic phenomena entail, they can appear to be extremely meaningful, as if they are the answer to a conundrum or difficulty we can no longer recall. We can better grasp these strange feelings once we connect them to the real process of falling asleep. If sleep necessitates a separation from the interpellative character of language, from the way words and thoughts grip us. These hypnagogic events may be the final gatepost, at the moment at which you're either being acknowledged or not. It's why they sometimes wake us up as if we're being summoned, and people frequently awake here to hear their own name shouted out, 
which is interpolation at its most basic level. However, as hypnagogia students have pointed out, most of the time when we are woken up by someone else rather than by ourselves, the words we remember are not directed at anyone in particular. It was argued that if the dream is the adventure, the hypnagogic image is a spectacle that does not require the sleeper's participation. Isn't this internal dualism of hypnagogic phenomena the key clue here? Words and images that appear essential to us either startle us awake, or they make us feel uninvolved and remote. Sleep will be simpler once we've passed through the gatepost of interpolation, as speech will no longer call us. It is in this sense of detaching from the interpellative, summoning function of language that Freud claimed that to sleep it is not the presence of stimuli that must change, but our relationship to them. This can help us understand how we fall asleep, sleep, and wake up. As we sleep, the interpellative dimension weakens or, more properly, is treated as shown in crib speech or bedtime stories. We've managed to dodge the interpellative while we've been sleeping. When we wake up, this function is the one that calls us. Indeed, when people wake up, they frequently address themselves in an imperative interpellation, get up, or speak to themselves in a bossy manner, a phenomenon that is much rarer when they are attempting to fall asleep. And interestingly, Eeg shows that as we doze off, our sensitivity to sound increases. Traditional psychoanalytic approaches to the issue of sleep have traditionally tended to focus on the ego and how it is apparently destroyed and then recomposed from sleeping to waking. But shifting the focus to language provides a new perspective. This may indicate the presence of certain types of insomnia, in which we are unable to separate our thoughts from our bodies. Because our focus cannot be freed, the thoughts continue to interpellate us. As Coleridge phrased it, my thoughts become their own lords the moment his head touches the pillow. This can either keep us awake or prevent us from going asleep. In a sense, we can't separate thoughts or images from their interpellative dimension, rather than the thoughts or images themselves. We must no longer be addressed, and our thoughts must cease to speak to us in order to sleep. Sleeping techniques, is there another form of attention that can actually help or even encourage sleep if a focus on sleep can prevent it? Simon Williams, a sleep sociologist, points to a statement by philosopher Morris Merleau-Ponty that raises some important considerations concerning insomnia. I call up the visitation of sleep by imitating the sleeper's breathing and posture, just as the faithful in the Dionysian mysteries invoke the god by miming episodes from his life. Sleep comes at a certain point, settling on the imitation of itself, that I've been feeding it, and I succeed in becoming what I was attempting to be. We sleep, then, by identifying with a sleeper, as if imitating what we assume their doing is the only way to become like them. You have to pretend to sleep in order to sleep, as one patient put it while describing her nightly routine. What an oddity. Are we truly persuaded to sleep by a process of imitation? We can't drive by imitating the driver's body language, nor can we accomplish any number of common human activities by imitating the external bodily acts of others. As various sleep researchers have pointed out, those who suffer from insomnia typically wish to sleep as long as another person. When we prepare for sleep, we act as if we are already sleeping. And this activity, importantly, entails an implicit identification with a sleeper, that is, with someone else. I believe the focus is on a third party rather than on our identification with ourselves while sleeping. We must imitate someone who is asleep in order to sleep. Despite the fact that this may appear shocking, doesn't it remind us of our very first life situation? It's possible that being close to the mother's body and being aware of her breathing rhythms are essential for a newborn to fall asleep. The child's breathing and heartbeat slow as well. When the mother is busy in the womb, Respiration rates increase, and when she is sleeping, they decrease. As adults, many people strive to slow down their breathing to prepare for sleep, as if synchronizing their bodily rhythms with those of an imaginary or actual mate. To achieve this effect in the 1940s, 
Doctors would place the earpieces of their stethoscopes in the ears of sleepless patients and the receivers on their hearts. Similarly, sleep interruptions in the mother have a direct impact on the child's sleep, which can last all the way into adulthood. Isn't it true that when we talk about a baby's adaptation to the rhythms of day and night in their first few weeks and months of life and their learning to sleep, we're really talking about the mother's adaptation to the rhythms of day and night, as we can see in the well-known sleep alterations that occur around three months. The way a mother's sleeping pattern alters has a reciprocity with that of her child. Seasonal changes in light and temperature appear to have minimal effect on this settling period. Sleeping through from around midnight to 5 a.m., and newborn sleep becomes more strong at this point. During this time, infants will undoubtedly wake up multiple times but will quickly fall back to sleep, and most parents will be unaware that their child has not slept through the night. Claytman had claimed that sleep was a construction in an early study, claiming that the shifts between 10 and 14 weeks were one of the first learnt performances, shifting from a wakefulness of need to a wakefulness of choice. When the parents are eating their own meals, the infant appears to be the most alert as though the child is interested in what they are doing. During this phase, the number of hours spent sleeping during the day decreases while the number of hours spent sleeping at night increases, resulting in fewer night feeds. The average night sleep hours tend to be steady from now until about six or seven months. As a result, there is a shift in sleep distribution and a new feeding pattern with previously unorganized day and night feeding patterns becoming more organized to follow the day, night cycle. The initial rest, activity cycle of about an hour is modified, twisted, and in part destroyed by the adjustment to the daily rhythm of living, as Claytman pointed out. We can see that Claytman's moms usually followed on-demand schedules, whereas only a few decades ago, it was normal for babies to be left wailing without night meals in the hopes of early socialization. The entrainment of the sleep pattern to the day. Night cycle is also linked to interactions with the caregiver. According to later study, Theodore Helberg demonstrated in a series of meticulous studies how circadian periodicity may be constructed from far shorter cycles, with maternal touch and mucous membrane stimulation being the earliest zeit gibbers. In this stage of developing bodily rhythms, light and darkness will be secondary, and adult speech and looks will also play a role. The mother's own sleep-wake cycle will affect her adaptation to the baby's perceived cycle. Therefore, this relationship aspect is critical. A mother will be influenced by her own pattern of daily activity and emotional particularity even if she is following the on-demand feeding schedule. This will influence how she reacts to the child, who will pick up on her ability to respond, her quickness of reaction, her interest in the baby's activities, her absences, and a variety of other parental handling details. The infant is particularly sensitive to how the mother expresses her own desire to sleep or stay up, as Sanford Gifford pointed out and the development of the child's sleep routine is thus partially controlled by his interaction with her. The important mystery is why this sleep pattern tends to stabilize around the three-month mark, and why deep slow-wave sleep begins to form around this time, as well as the transition from REM to NREM sleep. It may seem self-evident that it would be linked to some growth in the child's relationship with his or her mother and newborn researchers have looked into the variety and quality of contacts. The infants who settled by three months and those that did not appear to have distinct distinctions. The researchers initially attempted to link the quantity of meals to the settling pattern, but this proved to be fruitless. However, when they looked at what happened surrounding the feeds instead than the feeds themselves, they discovered that the time spent playing and interacting with the child around the feed was what separated the settling group from the non-settling group. Sleep may be established more easily if mother and kid elaborated things jointly. Many studies have found that the infant's ability to anticipate 
and postpone begins at three months. Which mirrors the importance of feeding interactions. This implies that the newborn is not overcome by hunger in the moment, but can anticipate the meal and the touch that comes with it. The number of night feeds decreases here, as if the infant understands that his mother will not abandon him forever. Many other scholars have linked this age to types of expectation, which means that it has symbolized something of the mother's absences and has registered the fact that she will return. This is never guaranteed, and some youngsters see mother absences as a bottomless pit or a betrayal. They might stare into space or rock themselves mechanically when the mother returns. Later in life, the absence of a lover or acquaintance might be perceived as an act of unfathomable cruelty, leading to complete retreat or, in some cases, retaliation. Here, a surgery must take place that symbolizes and makes meaning of the mother's movements, making other separations more acceptable. It's probable that this connects to three months settling and the ability to sleep through the night for several hours and that individual variances in settling age correspond to changes in the symbolization process. If this is the case, it begs the question of whether or not this mechanism is linked to insomnia. What if there was no way of knowing when the mother will return? What must we be for her if she is willing to abandon us? What is the significance of our existence? When we wake up, this function is the one that calls us. Indeed, when people wake up, they frequently address themselves in an imperative interpellation. Get up, or speak to themselves in a bossy manner. A phenomenon that is much rarer when they are attempting to fall asleep. And interestingly, Eeg shows that as we doze off, our sensitivity to sound increases. Traditional psychoanalytic approaches to the issue of sleep have traditionally tended to focus on the ego and how it is apparently destroyed and then recomposed from sleeping to waking. But shifting the focus to language provides a new perspective. This may indicate the presence of certain types of insomnia, in which we are unable to separate our thoughts from our bodies. Because our focus cannot be freed, the thoughts continue to interpellate us. As Coleridge phrased it, my thoughts become their own lords the moment his head touches the pillow. This can either keep us awake or prevent us from going asleep. In a sense, we can't separate thoughts or images from their interpellative dimension, rather than the thoughts or images themselves. We must no longer be addressed, and our thoughts must cease to speak to us in order to sleep. Sleeping techniques. Is there another form of attention that can actually help or even encourage sleep if a focus on sleep can prevent it? Simon Williams, a sleep sociologist, points to a statement by philosopher Morris Merleau-Ponty that raises some important considerations concerning insomnia. I call up the visitation of sleep by imitating the sleeper's breathing and posture, just as the faithful in the Dionysian mysteries invoke the god by miming episodes from his life. Sleep comes at a certain point, settling on the imitation of itself, that I've been feeding it, and I succeed in becoming what I was attempting to be. We sleep, then, by identifying with a sleeper, as if imitating what we assume they're doing is the only way to become like them. You have to pretend to sleep in order to sleep, as one patient put it while describing her nightly routine. What an oddity. Are we truly persuaded to sleep by a process of imitation? We can't drive by imitating the driver's body language, nor can we accomplish any number of common human activities by imitating the external bodily acts of others. As various sleep researchers have pointed out, those who suffer from insomnia typically wish to sleep as long as another person. When we prepare for sleep, we act as if we are already sleeping. And this activity, importantly, entails an implicit identification with a sleeper, that is, with someone else. I believe the focus is on a third party rather than on our identification with ourselves while sleeping. We must imitate someone who is asleep in order to sleep. Despite the fact that this may appear shocking, doesn't it remind us of our very first life situation? It's possible that being close to the mother's body and being aware of her breathing rhythms are essential for a newborn to fall asleep. The child's breathing and heartbeat slow as well. When the mother is busy in the womb, Respiration rates increase, 
and when she is sleeping, they decrease. As adults, many people strive to slow down their breathing to prepare for sleep, as if synchronizing their bodily rhythms with those of an imaginary or actual mate. To achieve this effect in the 1940s, doctors would place the earpieces of their stethoscopes in the ears of sleepless patients and the receivers on their hearts. Similarly, sleep interruptions in the mother have a direct impact on the child's sleep, which can last all the way into adulthood. Isn't it true that when we talk about a baby's adaptation to the rhythms of day and night in their first few weeks and months of life and their learning to sleep, we're really talking about the mother's adaptation to the rhythms of day and night, as we can see in the well-known sleep alterations that occur around three months. The way a mother's sleeping pattern alters has a reciprocity with that of her child. Seasonal changes in light and temperature appear to have minimal effect on the settling period. Sleeping through from around midnight to 5 a.m., and newborn sleep becomes more strong at this point. During this time, infants will undoubtedly wake up multiple times but will quickly fall back to sleep. And most parents will be unaware that their child has not slept through the night. Clayton had claimed that sleep was a construction in an early study, claiming that the shifts between 10 and 14 weeks were one of the first alert performances, shifting from a wakefulness of need to a wakefulness of choice. When the parents are eating their own meals, the infant appears to be the most alert as though the child is interested in what they are doing. During this phase, the number of hours spent sleeping during the day decreases while the number of hours spent sleeping at night increases, resulting in fewer night feeds. The average night sleep hours tend to be steady from now until about six or seven months. As a result, there is a shift in sleep distribution and a new feeding pattern with previously unorganized day and night feeding patterns becoming more organized to follow the day, night cycle. The initial rest, activity cycle of about an hour is modified, twisted, and in part destroyed by the adjustment to the daily rhythm of living, as Claytman pointed out. We can see that Claytman's moms usually followed on-demand schedules, whereas only a few decades ago, it was normal for babies to be left wailing without night meals in the hopes of early socialization. The entrainment of the sleep pattern to the day. Night cycle is also linked to interactions with the caregiver. According to later study, Theodore Helbert demonstrated in a series of meticulous studies how circadian periodicity may be constructed from far shorter cycles, with maternal touch and mucous membrane stimulation being the earliest zeitgebers. In this stage of developing bodily rhythms, light and darkness will be secondary, and adult speech and looks will also play a role. The mother's own sleep-wake cycle will affect her adaptation to the baby's perceived cycle. Therefore, this relationship aspect is critical. The mother will be influenced by her own pattern of daily activity and emotional particularity even if she is following the on-demand feeding schedule. This will influence how she reacts to the child, who will pick up on her ability to respond, her quickness of reaction, her interest in the baby's activities, her absences, and a variety of other parental handling details. The infant is particularly sensitive to how the mother expresses her own desire to sleep or stay up. As Sanford Gifford pointed out, and the development of the child's sleep routine is thus partially controlled by his interaction with her. The important mystery is why the sleep pattern tends to stabilize around the three-month mark, and why deep slow-wave sleep begins to form around this time, as well as the transition from REM to NREM sleep. It may seem self-evident that it would be linked to some growth in the child's relationship with his or her mother and newborn researchers have looked into the variety and quality of contacts. The infants who settled by three months and those that did not appear to have distinct distinctions. The researchers initially attempted to link the quantity of meals to the settling pattern, but this proved to be fruitless. However, 
when they looked at what happened surrounding the feeds instead than the feeds themselves. They discovered that the time spent playing and interacting with the child around the feed was what separated the settling group from the non-settling group. Sleep may be established more easily if mother and kid elaborated things jointly. Many studies have found that the infant's ability to anticipate and postpone begins at three months, which mirrors the importance of feeding interactions. This implies that the newborn is not overcome by hunger in the moment, but can anticipate the meal and the touch that comes with it. The number of night feeds decreases here, as if the infant understands that his mother will not abandon him forever. Many other scholars have linked this age to types of expectation, which means that it has symbolized something of the mother's absences and has registered the fact that she will return. This is never guaranteed, and some youngsters see mother absences as a bottomless pit or a betrayal. They might stare into space or rock themselves mechanically when the mother returns. Later in life, the absence of a lover or acquaintance might be perceived as an act of unfathomable cruelty, leading to complete retreat or, in some cases, retaliation. Here, a surgery must take place that symbolizes and makes meaning of the mother's movements, making other separations more acceptable. It's probable that this connects to three months settling and the ability to sleep through the night for several hours, and that individual variances in settling age correspond to changes in this symbolization process. If this is the case, it begs the question of whether or not this mechanism is linked to insomnia. What if there was no way of knowing when the mother will return? What must we be for her if she is willing to abandon us? What is the significance of our existence? Hartman observed this symbolic dimension in his investigation of the sleeping medicine. People don't take sleeping pills because they have insomnia. They ask for sleeping pills and someone gives them to them. He explained, taking a sleeping pill is an interaction that can indicate receiving permission from a parental authority who says, it's all right to go to sleep in the same way that a pregnancy can occur when an adoption agency finally gives the green light. It can also serve as a transitional item or a security blanket, indicating that the doctor or ally is nearby. Someone will offer me something to demonstrate his love, to demonstrate that I am valuable. As a result, the sleeping pill becomes a present, a gesture of affection, just as it can be a means of transferring potency, an oral type of impregnation, or even slow suicide. It's no secret that we live in a world where prescriptions are easy to get by. But the amount of people I encounter in their early 20s and 30s who are already addicted to sleeping medications is astonishing. They may obtain the medications over the internet or by going from one private doctor to another to gain the necessary prescription. But national health GPs will occasionally collude by prescribing antidepressants as sleep medicine. Repeat prescriptions are written for what are clearly transient sleep disorders due to anxiety, with no thorough assessment. For at least 40 years, the painter Francis Bacon used sleeping pills every night. And when I asked one of the doctors who gave them why they were essential, he claimed he had never inquired. To protect ourselves from learning too much, it may be easier to accept insomnia as a truth that requires no further explanation. It's especially concerning in young individuals who may never be able to wean themselves off medicines that even the most corrupted sleep hygienists recognize as harmful and ineffective. There can be a panic at the idea of having run out of S99 as ineffective and risky there is a sense of fear when you realize you've run out of medicines and know you won't be able to sleep without them. As Hartman pointed out, the pill can serve as a transitional object, a condition for sleeping, and the demand that it be available at all times echoes our desire for our caregivers to not abandon us, that they, like the pill, be available at all times, or that we have replaced them with something that needs to be available at all times, but isn't them. Even if the pills are never eaten, sleep is impossible to contemplate without knowing they are there. The prospect of being without them is agonizing, just as a repeat prescription is reassuring, 
we've been given what we require. The dynamics of giving and asking, demanding and prescribing clearly demonstrate how we exist in a space formed by relational and social activities. When a newborn screams, it may get the breast or bottle as if it were an instinctive reflex. But the symbolic side of these interactions becomes obvious very quickly. After all, a cry is being understood as a request for food, company, or a diaper change. And whatever the cry's original motive, the meaning of the answer it receives will transform it. We may relate the infant's cries for its mother to what is known as the ask, the point at which fundraisers and charity workers risk upsetting a carefully built connection by eventually asking for a gift. This wad is so vital and precarious that there are even workshops and seminars that teach people how to fulfill it, demonstrating how far we've come from the simple, biologically centered demands of childhood. A link between feeding, demanding, and sleeping is arguably most obvious in the nighttime visits to the refrigerator described by so many insomniacs and night wakers. A desire for food interrupts the night, allowing either a return to sleep or an exacerbation of guilt over eating too much. Many people stay awake at night reminiscing over what they ate and drank the day before or meticulously planning what they will eat and drink the next day. Even more so with nighttime feeds, because the person may not be sure where they should be with yesterday's intake or tomorrow's. We could recall the case of the young woman who would wake up at 3 a.m. and then go back to sleep at 5 a.m. and whose flatmates were completely unaware of her secret. She mentioned her greed for these liminal spaces several times as she spoke about them. And it's maybe no coincidence that when she sought therapy later, it was for a bulimia that had taken the place of the early wakings. Compulsive feeding and a sliver of time in the middle of the night were both the same. This relationship is reflected in the strange assumption that sharks don't sleep because they are continually eating, which many people seem to share. Some marine mammals can sleep unihemispherically, which means that one half of the brain sleeps while the other remains awake, at least according to normal EEG measurements which means they can swim continuously with one eye closed and one flipper idle. This, however, is not the same as eating. This is one of those images that seems to stick in people's heads. So it must be touching on something in us, possibly the sense that sleep is simply what happens in between meals, and that sleeping equals not eating, and so deprivation. It's no wonder that ideas of deprivation cluster around sleep so quickly and easily. Have I slept enough? Have I gotten the appropriate amount of sleep? Is it true that I'm unable to sleep? Why is it that my sleep is being taken away from me? These are the kinds of thoughts we could expect a newborn to have when it comes to the breast or bottle. Have I been given enough? What's the deal with my feet getting cut off? Is my food being taken away from me? The promotion of a standard eight hours, will only heighten these worries by playing on the intuitive link between food, or rather, its absence in sleep. It could also explain the historical appeal of some old medical theories of sleep, which suggested that a hungry brain had a diminished blood supply, as if the latter were a kind of insatiable cerebral mouth. Many people believe that they won't be able to sleep until they have an orgasm first which demonstrates the link between sleep and deprivation. Sleep is frequently associated with sex in this context. In the stock image, the male falls asleep while the woman desires to prolong their intimacy through conversation. Sleep has been regarded as a traumatic withdrawal from the possibility of intimacy, as well as the shock of dedumescence. Yet sleep and orgasm are frequently linked much earlier in childhood and adolescent masturbatory behaviors. Sleep, the individual feels, is only possible if they have arrived. And if this does not happen for whatever reason, sleep is inaccessible, fractured or truncated, with a strong sense of not having received something. Insomnia becomes a punishment for being frustrated. As with eating, the key here is the notion of conditionality. Something has to 
Chapin in order for sleep to be feasible. Whether it's oral or genital, it shows how strong our sense of entitlement is. Item must be given to us in order for us to sleep. And that something must be given by an outside source. As a result, sleep is deeply relational entwined with our ancestral tie to others. Both of these hypotheses link orality to dreaming and REM sleep, but in very different ways. The dream is positioned in the first viewpoint as what fills in for an object that isn't there, the mother's breast. Instead of eating, we dream, with the dream's prototype being a hallucinated oral fulfillment. A second explanation connects the dream to a transition, in which the breast has become a symbolic object rather than a genuine missing. We dream here not because we're hungry, but because we're hungry. Feeding is never truly feeding because of its symbolic status. It is always something more or less. In their own ways, both of these hypotheses are instructive. Although the frequency of feeding cannot be directly linked to REM periods, the possibility of a link is intriguing, especially considering how the REM like state of the first few weeks of life will eventually transform into the more separated units that we see later. In neonates, Ronald Harper and his UCLA colleagues discovered that REM phases were far more likely to occur after waking with feeding than waking alone, implying a further relationship between feeding and the sleep cycle. This REM duration would decline dramatically 20 minutes after the feeding ceased, showing that the REM and quiet sleep cycles were being entrained by the feeds. Such sleep cycle entrainment shows that the mother, in managing feeding time, may also be indirectly modifying sleep cycling in her newborn. They conclude. This link is also present right from the outset of Clayton and Asarinsky's investigation, implying an agenda that their Chicago team would eventually overlook. It is obvious that communications with the mother have a symbolic dimension. Albeit whether this is a cause of sleep is debatable. Is it always possible to prevent disappointment by sleeping? The idea that sleep is produced in the absence of a lack or absence. Whatever this is theorized and that it is structured by the sense of wanting is shared by both approaches. The extraordinary prevalence of sleep science experiments that involve some form of deprivation of REM, NREM, food, water, light, darkness, environmental comforts, and so on, might suggest a reflection of this very fact, as if the contours of sleep are implicitly defined by this idea of something being missing or even forcibly denied or withheld. To find out the truth about sleep, we must deprive the sleeper in some way. Yet the oral arguments would infer, on the contrary, that as sleep is in essence the outcome of a deprivation, sleep would thus serve a more or less defensive purpose. And numerous studies suggest that children fall asleep relatively immediately after having a traumatic or distressing experience. Children whose mothers were rushed to the hospital fell asleep faster and slept deeper for longer than other children. Children that were circumcised without anesthetic tended to fall into deep slumber quickly, contrary to the researchers' expectations that the pain would cause more weeping and restlessness. His babies had a significantly higher rate of NREM sleep than a control group. Monica, a 15-month-old girl who had to be fed through a tube into her stomach owing to esophageal atresia, was visited by a number of psychiatrists and physicians who were interested in her condition, and she would fall into a deep sleep anytime she wanted to avoid interaction. Many popular baby sleeping methods have been viewed in this way as well. Sleep has been reported to be improved by programs in which the parent either lets the child scream or gradually increases the amount of time the child is left weeping at bedtime and during the night. Everyone is content while they work. However, critics have linked the child's profound slumber to this defensive shutting down. It's not about falling into the comforting arms of sleep, but rather urgently switching out as a response to trauma. Is this going to leave an indelible impact on their sleep? Isn't it also implying that different types of sleep exist? This is something we've noticed in older kids and adults as well. During the Second World War, when air raids were common, 
An overwhelming sleep was frequently described if the actual attack did not arrive quickly after the sirens. As strange as it may seem, soldiers can fall asleep while waiting for an attack. Ian Oswald recalls a rear gunner on a bombing mission who couldn't remain awake as the most dangerous section of the journey neared. When one of my patients didn't want to think about a particular portion of his past that had been discussed, he would fall asleep on the sofa almost methodically, and many other practitioners have reported similar experiences. Sleep has also been classified as a displacement activity by ethologists who have seen how birds like the avocet and oyster catcher fall asleep when stuck between the instincts to fight and to flee. When we are in situations of pain and anguish, sleep is the template of all defense. According to Spitz, an archaic physiological and psychological withdrawal. However, one can wonder if staying awake serves the same purpose. When we go through the various research on the impact of mother, child relations on sleep. We notice how frequently issues and frictions lead to either deep slumber or an inability or reluctance to fall asleep, as if the two states were poles of a psychical equation. Several studies have found that children of mothers who reacted violently to sleep interruptions or who encouraged or exaggerated them fell asleep very instantly or slept slowly. The relational part of human development in which we internalize aspects of our relationships with others and how this impacts us throughout our lives is something that sleep research loses out on. Just as falling asleep can be connected to a child's early relationship with his or her mother, so can waking up. When babies and infants wake up, it's sometimes attributed to hunger. But just as hunger is inextricably linked to the process of interaction with the caregiver, so is awakening. The infant may be looking for interaction and discourse here, as he or she awakens from the basic need for nourishment. And it's no coincidence that people typically report their most acute sense of identity loss when they wake up in a strange place, as if we expect to receive the coordinates of who we are in that split second after awakening. Heading ready to rise, the subject of who and what we wake up to has been entwined with waking up since the beginning of time. The difference between waking up to find mum and waking up to no one is clear. Many people's low spirits and sorrow in older age may be due to a sense of someone not being there, rather than the expectation of another day of drudgery at work. If we awoke in the early months to find someone caring for us, or close by, we awoke later to find her gone. This hole is quickly filled with ideas of things we have to do disagreeable jobs and chores that at least give this void some kind of content, however terrible it may be. Spitz and some of his colleagues modified the original emphasis on the child's relationship with the breast in the dispute we addressed previously about oral theories of dreaming. They said that during feeding, the kid spends the majority of its time staring or attempting to stare at the mother's face which acts as a sort of screen onto which dreams are projected during sleep. The concept is perhaps fantastical, but when we connect it to the subject of what we wake up to, it becomes more interesting. Most people check and scrutinize the same aspect of their body in the bathroom mirror before going to bed and when they wake up, their face. Could it be that our own image takes the place of the mother's face, which we seek not only when we are feeding, but also when we are awake. It's possible that hearing people lament the fact that they look just like their mother as they get ready for bed is not a coincidence. Our sleep arrangements are influenced by the matter of who we fall asleep with and wake up with. The unusual emergence of the practice of solitary or private sleeping has piqued the interest of childcare experts and historians alike. A human newborn is one of the only creatures that does not sleep in direct touch with the mother's body according to Anna Freud, who noted this many years ago. Although sleeping in the same room or bed is and has been the most common nighttime scenario for the majority of the world's population, progressive sanctions against it have been implemented in the West and increasingly worldwide during the last 150 years. Infants must be separated from their parents and, if finances allow, 
have their own room. This is supposed to encourage independence, while also allowing the parents to sleep undisturbed. But it's strange that the newborn is expected to sleep on its own while the parents are frequently unable to do so. Sleep will undoubtedly be influenced by how this separation issue is addressed. If sleeping without someone else means being alone, it's likely that some level of trust in their return and vicinity is required. Children will soon have various methods to elaborate and signify this question. As we saw previously, how being able to predict this may be linked to the famous three-month settling. Children who awoke frequently during the night tended to be those who could only fall asleep when rocked or carried. According to infant researchers, those who did not need to be held or rocked slept better than those who thumbset or utilized transitional objects more frequently. They had substituted something else for bodily contact. Similarly, caregivers of waking babies hugged and stroked them more frequently, maybe as a manifestation of their own fear, or sexuality rather as a response to the child's suffering. They would also respond to daytime weeping more quickly than the mothers of better sleepers. According to Isabel Parrott, Mothers who had separation issues as children may want to hold on to their children for longer in order to provide the togetherness that they never had. Just as mothers who have strong negative feelings toward their babies may feel reassured if they wake up in the night to confirm that they are alive and unharmed. One of my patients traced her sleep issues back to the birth of her first kid, whom she had kept in bed with her for the first few months of his life. Her mother had cautioned her about the hazards of co-sleeping, and she would lie awake at night, thinking what might happen if she fell asleep on her child. Years later, she'd still be awake, waiting for her son to get home following a night out. His sleep problems were only alleviated when she was able to begin to articulate her loathing for her son, which was made all the more difficult by her great and pervasive love for him. He had taken her life, and he had failed to grow into the good little kid she had longed for. In another case, a mother would wake her baby several times during the night, first for companionship, and then to reassure herself that her daughter was still alive. The nighttime play obscured a panic that became evident to her when she connected it to her own past. Her mother had lost a child before her, and the specter of the dead baby hovered over her anxieties. Interestingly, she did not complain about the arduous evenings, despite hardly sleeping. She thought the possibility of not having kids was considerably worse. It's interesting to notice how, much as some modern child hygiene encourages allowing the baby to sleep on his or her own, most sleep science insists on isolating the test subject. The subject is connected to an EEG and other devices that measure eye movement, heart rate, respiration rate, and muscular tone, and is urged to sleep in a single bed. Mummy isn't present, and the subjects are almost always too embarrassed to go through the elaborate night rituals that they would have at home. They don't have sex with a bedfellow or masturbate, but we anticipate this completely artificial subject to reveal the truth about sleep. Similarly, the topic of waking up is rarely discussed. Although there must be a distinction between waking up and being woken, the resulting anger or annoyance is never considered in the research findings. Any parent who interacts with their children knows that waking them up causes behaviors and moods that are diametrically opposed to those that would result from allowing them to get up at their own pace. It's even possible to argue that not being awakened is part of the definition of sleep. And there's a big difference between those who are and aren't allowed to wake up and those who aren't. Queen Elizabeth came for a state banquet in full regalia during an official visit to Morocco in October 1980, only to find the palace closed and no one to attend to her. The palace was actually open during her departure feast a few days later, but her host, Hassan II, was once again absent. No one had dared to wake the sleeping king. What may appear to be a light-hearted narrative takes on a darker hue when we consider the potential ramifications of this reverence. And military history is littered with examples of men who have refused to wake a commanding officer, 
often with disastrous results. The subject of awakening is also openly equated with murder in the latest film Passengers. Thousands of would-be colonists are fast asleep on their route to a faraway planet, but one of them wakes up 90 years too early owing to a mechanical error. It is impossible for a single person to return to hibernation, and he is aware that he will perish before the ship arrives at its destination. He becomes enamored with one of the sleeping passengers, played by Jennifer Lawrence, and decides to wake her up as he contemplates his horrible and lonely fate. What appears to be a romance is actually a homicide. Awakening her is practically a murder, as it means that she will now die before they arrive at their objective. In Passengers, the protagonist is saved from loneliness by the dangerous act of waking and it is no coincidence that many of the features of both newborn and adult sleep suggest connections with others. Changes in motility, crying, facial expression, startles, urinating, excretion, and mouthing, all of which have been studied in infants through sleep research, are spaces where relating takes place, as most of them occur within or initiate interactions. They're never just simple biological behaviors, and the parents' responsiveness through voice, touch, staring, and feeding will assist form the infant's neurological, autonomic, and hormonal functioning. When babies wake up in the middle of the night, they either fall back to sleep or involve a parent, and how the latter responds, or fails to respond, may have an impact on their sleep patterns. In the mornings, a woman described herself as irritable and unhappy, resentful of having to get up and go to work. What could be more natural on one level? Though we all despise the responsibilities of early mornings and the tasks that follow. However, this commonplace attitude had its own past, which formed the harshness of her experience. Her father had favored her siblings over her, and his death when she was a child had left her with primarily frustrated and excluded memories. But she recalled that he had let her sleep one rare day, opting not to wake her for school. When she finally awoke, her siblings had already left, and she perceived her father's action as a loving gesture. Although it was never repeated, it was maybe for this precise reason that it smattered so much to her. A one instant when he had chosen her over the Southers. The demands of daily life had been abandoned that morning and she imagined how he would have seen her sleeping and made his decision. For many years following, this idea of love would control her waking experience, as if getting up and getting ready for the day meant denying the potential of being lovable. The mundane and monotonous process of awakening had become a jolt to her sense of self, instinctively reminding her of everything she'd lost. A relationship's complexity and depth lie outside it. The fantasy of the sleep lab, on the other hand, is that relationships don't matter, or that if they do, they must be minimized or factored out in order to get at the true biology of the human body. In sleep, however, as the psychoanalyst, S. Mark Kanzer pointed out, we are never completely alone, or we strive not to be. Whether it's a child's desire for his parent, an adult's demand for their partner, or the demand for lights, cuddly toys, drinks, food, and so on, we all sleep with some form of index of others. It's difficult not to notice that in Dement's best-selling book some must watch while others must sleep. There are constant and oddly intrusive illustrations of a sleeper being watched over by someone else, as if to acknowledge this repressed aspect of sleep research. Dement, Claytman, and Asarinsky all utilized their own children in their experiments as if they were the parent who was monitoring them. We might recall that when Claytman sequestered himself in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky in 1938 for what is arguably the most renowned sleep experiment in the discipline's history, he did it alongside his pupil Bruce Richardson. They wanted to determine if they could adjust to a six-day week with 28-hour days in a setting with no variation in light, temperature, or sound. It would be free from external factors such as sunshine, temperature fluctuation, and other people's activity, 
according to a news statement from the University of Chicago. But if Claytman had brought someone with him, how could he be free of others? And they were attended on by workers from the Mammoth Cave Hotel in their 140 feet deep laboratory, who would deliver fried chicken and hickory smoked country ham every day, along with newspapers and correspondence. The experiment was portrayed in the media as if the two were castaways. Yet the action of others was always present. Their interactions would have immediate consequences for the experiment. As Claytman, who refused to take naps himself, prevented Richardson from napping outside of their nine-hour window. So, even in Mammoth Cave's isolation, the stamp of human social order was present. A prohibition. After publishing their findings, Claytman was unable to rewire his physical rhythm although Richardson was more effective. We may speculate about the physiological repercussions of their interactions, and how this intimate and forced proximity between an older and a younger guy would have influenced their sleep and body temperature. Human interaction has always had an effect on sleep data, from the experimenter's sex to the expectation of producing dreams to the quantity and frequency of dream recall in both REM and NREM sleep, according to the few research that have looked into such matters. When there is true and continuous isolation, as in solitary imprisonment or self-imposed cave habitation, a curious trait occurs if there is no one else there. Despite increasing physical and psychological anguish, Mitchell Siffer discovered that time flew by when he spent 58 days in a cave with no timepiece and no delivery of fried chicken. He refused to believe it until the date of his release was revealed just before the conclusion of the two-month term he had set. He estimated that he only had approximately a month left in the cave. Similar underestimate of time has been observed by inmates who, contrary to expectations, are astonished when their sentence is announced. Time had been passing so quickly that they had expected many days or even weeks. Edith Bone, who was imprisoned by the Rikosi administration in Budapest in 1949 on espionage charges, commented that, despite what she had read, time lingered in jail. I did not find it to be so. On the contrary, it raced by too fast. When I messed up the evening, in midday meals and assumed dinner was lunch. The guards would stare at me puzzled. And during his 19 years in a Chinese prison, nine of which were spent in solitary confinement, Richard Fecto discovered that time could be abolished by daydreaming, and therefore it passed quickly. His isolation, however, the most important component here. Following the 1906 Courrières mining accident in France, in which 1,099 miners were murdered in a major explosion. Thirteen survivors remained below in a cramped space for about three weeks, while being convinced when rescued that they had only been underground for four or five days. Similarly, three brothers trapped under rubble for 18 days following the 1908 earthquake in Messina judged the time elapsed to be four or five days at most a fact that piqued the interest of modern scholars. In settings of sensory isolation or severe detachment from the framework of normal life, experimental tests would corroborate this continuous miscalculation of time. But why doesn't time seem to go more slowly here, as it does for insomniacs who are alone with their thoughts at night? Isn't it true that fear and anxiety tend to lengthen rather than shorten time? Is it more about overestimating the time that lies ahead than it is about underestimating the time that has already been spent. Arguments that the prisoner is simply disoriented owing to a lack of habitual zeitgebers are useless, as regular mealtimes in the day, night cycle are still present in many cases of solitary confinement. Is it a sense of powerlessness or, more exactly, complete reliance on the other? the rescuer, or the jailers. If this is the case, it may harken back to our first moments of dependency on our caregivers, implying that our perception of time is shaped by our relationships with people and how we are able, or unwilling, to wait for them. 
Understanding these mechanisms can help us gain a better understanding of sleep and insomnia. Some people can't stand being alone, while others can. And how we communicate and make meaning of our relationships with others must have an impact on our sleep. It's hard to believe that a child who is awakened in the middle of the night to care to its mother, or who wakes up and calls for her, would not wonder what it meant to her, or, as analysts describe it, what they are for the other. This nagging childhood question follows us throughout our lives, heightened, punctuated, or diminished by our professional, romantic, and sexual situations. Is it possible that we are an object for the other? Do they really know who we are? Do they hear what we're saying? Is it true that we are lovable? Can we be wished for? Are they going to abandon us? The most prevalent parental attitude toward children's sleep issues between the ages of one and three, according to a Menninger Clinic research, was that it represented the child's fear that they, particularly the mother, would abandon them. As one parent expressed it, this child's problem falling asleep is due to his need for me to be present at all times. For both the parent and the kid, the question of their worth to the other is important. And it is in the tangle of these two sets of concerns that some of the most persistent insomnias emerge. Each is perplexed by the other's query. A woman with a decades-long history of insomnia revealed her agony at bedtime. As a youngster, afraid of her parents' approaching separation, her nighttime cries, on the other hand, would almost always summon her father to her room, as her anxiousness was too much for him to take. He'd stand outside her door with pursed ears, waiting for the tiniest sound from her, then rush to her aid. He couldn't bear to let me sleep, she said in a charming slip where she had wanted to add that he couldn't endure her not sleeping. Later in life, just before going to bed, she would write her parents every day, as if to repair the barrier between them. Her father's own problems with separation emphasized the daily urgency of this ritual. Her conscious guilt at living away from her parents, and her terror of being alone. The more a parent has conquered such fears, the simpler it may be for a child to do so as well. And to find strategies to deal with the question, what am I for the other? This could indicate that sleep is enabled by a process of symbolization of this very issue. Unless the child is preoccupied with the question of what they are for the other, and thus whether the other can leave them or not, the better they will sleep. This is a phenomenon we see in adults as well, who frequently report deep and satisfying sleep after someone has signified their love for them. If there is insomnia associated with our inability to separate from interpolation, from the thoughts that plague us. There is another type of insomnia in which we lie awake, unable to sleep, but with no specific rumination or concern. This is anxiety-related sleeplessness. The person frequently describes a blankness, as if the body, rather than the job of the mind, is keeping them awake. There is no because of in this insomnia, according to writer Marie Dariusik. It is an insomnia with no reason, simply a terrifying lucidity. The body serves as an obstruction, as if an agitation or sense of urgency is encapsulated there, and the sensation of time is less that of clocks and symbolic measurements and more that of the object. We stay awake at night, waiting for anything to happen, as if only a miracle could save us. As a result, Turning to food or sleeping medications may appear to be the only option. Perhaps we are suspended from the question of what we are for the other in its purest form during this type of insomnia. However, we are no longer thinking, calculating, or second-guessing. Instead, we have been reduced to a condition of bodily misery. Many people spend their nights rehearsing fantasies in which they are a celebrity or a hero as a method of guaranteeing themselves of a place. They have won a sporting prize, saved someone from a car accident, or foiled a terrorist attack. They know what they are for the other at the succeeding moment of adoration or thankfulness. Thus, the fantasies shelter people from a place in which they don't know what they're doing, 
and it's this space that we can locate in the second variety of sleeplessness. We've turned off interpolation, but we've gone from ideas to something even worse. There's no longer anything beckoning us. The person may claim that they are not worried about anything, but yet can't sleep. And this is a peculiar detail that appears repeatedly. It's like I'm being punished for something, one insomniac adds. Except I have no idea what I did. A lexicon of punishment keeps reappearing in descriptions of this most debilitating sleeplessness. That there is a disjunction between the punishment and the offense because there is no cognition, care, or concern that would rationalize the insomnia. Sleep deprivation. The issue of guilt is prevalent in parent-child interactions when it comes to sleeping. When a child's sleep is disrupted, the parent often feels obliged to act. They must become involved in some way, and it's normal to believe that the child's failure to settle is their fault or obligation because of whatever they, the parents, have done incorrectly. The youngster is not sleeping. Parents may blame themselves for their child's insomnia, implying their own unworthiness as a parent or, in some cases, their ambivalence for the child. Oh, we often think of nighttime routines, which appear in the second and third years of life. As anxiety therapies, they can also be used to instill guilt in both the parent and the child. All human communities have rituals that book in sleep, which can range from a prayer or spell to double-checking that doors are locked and stoves are turned off to moving one's tongue against one's teeth in a specific way. Aside from the conventional instructions of cleaning and grooming the body, the presence of an object, such as a stuffed toy, and some rhythmic activity, such as stroking or rubbing, are likely the two most prevalent prerequisites. These are the requirements that surround sleep, and their most noticeable feature is their repetition. They must be gone over and done before entering the state of sleep. Why does sleep necessitate such unusual preparation? And why are so many people unable to sleep when their nighttime rituals have been disrupted or compromised? All we now identify the time before and after sleeping with physical activities such as brushing our teeth, undressing, and showering. These preparations were also spiritual in the early modern period. Specific prayers would be said before and after sleep, as well as during the watching interval in between. Undressing, lying down, waking between the two sleeps, and morning waking were all accompanied by prayers. Sleep was a particular realm in which the soul was purified and one's relationship with God was no longer muddled by the distractions of the day. Therefore, the person had to be prepared for the night. One of the most popular medieval prayers which is still frequently used today, made the link clear. Now I lay me down to sleep. I beseech the Lord to keep my soul. Sins had to be atoned for, and devotional literature, and items might be used to help with this. Our modern rituals of washing and brushing are almost certainly derived from this idea of spiritual cleanliness, as if the physical activities were a metaphorical extension of this other form of cleansing. Washing may have started out as a moral concern rather than a concern for hygiene. Sleep would be a reward for Christian behavior once it was done. We need a clear conscience to sleep. This period is the devil's black book, wherein he recordeth all our crimes, as Thomas Nash described it in his 1594 treatise, The Terrors of the Night. The devil surrenders to our recollections a real bill of parcels of his abhorrent immoralities. Our heart's table has been changed into an inventory of wrongdoings, and all of our thoughts have become condemnation messages. As we pour over our SMS lawn to mentally rewrite or amend our conversations, this last clause may be inverted today, such that all of our texts become thoughts condemning us. The idea that we identify and tally our sins the numerous ways in which we have failed or done something wrong is a constant here. Evolutionary theorists may interpret George Herbert's words. Sum up at night. What thou haste done by day, divided by and in the morning. What thou haste to do, 
as a cognitive encouragement to learn new facts that can be consolidated while sleeping, but it is more likely linked to a calculus of sin and penitence, a summing up serves as a record of one's deeds, which can be examined and judged whereas the morning rehearsal of one's commitments attempts to ensure Christian behavior. During this time, sleep was frequently perceived as a technique of calming anger and sadness, as well as treating impurity. But the two operations are not unrelated. Effect and emotion historians have demonstrated how distinct traditions, like as the Augustinian and the Stoic, have been at work here. Passions must be abolished, were negated for logical conduct to take place in the latter case. Thinking is gradually separated from emotion and given precedence, a distinction that is repeated in today's cognitive therapies. The Augustinian tradition, on the other hand, aims to give emotions a purpose, a right orientation rather than deleting them. Imitating Christ meant identifying with his passion and allowing a positive emotion like love to transform or redirect rage or hatred. This is in stark contrast to the Stoic worldview, in which optimal performance is related to the excision of affections. In Cicero's Tusculan Disputations, the ideal Stoic responds to the death of his kid by saying, I was already aware that I had begotten a mortal. Of course, the well-known insomnias that so often accompany grief belie this detachment. And it's noteworthy that, once again, this inability to sleep is associated to guilt rather than sadness. We could consider the father's rebuke in the burning child dream we examined earlier, as well as a plethora of literary and filmic examples. Sleep is the most innocent creature, and the sleepless man the most guilty, wrote Kafka. As it was for Coleridge laying awake, everything appeared guilt, remorse, or woe. So it is for Freud's weeping father, or Henry IV, or Macbeth's guilty rulers. The absence of a clear conscience, the knowledge that they have blood on their hands, or believe they do, is what keeps them awake. Rejections and disappointments in love have been linked to sleep deprivation in literature, but the motif of guilt is considerably more common. What does it mean that a cloudy conscience prevents us from sleeping or wakes us up during the night? Sleeping like a baby or the sleep of innocence reinforce this link of sleep with innocence. To sleep like that signifies that no wrongdoing has occurred. Should we simply interpret this as a result of the Christian concept of sleep as purification or as something that has nothing to do with religion? It's difficult to deny the reality that a big portion of the population can only sleep after distancing themselves from their daily worries by watching TV shows like Law and Order or CSI, in which a crime is cleanly solved in a set amount of time. When a wrong is done, an investigation is launched, and the perpetrator is captured and punished. If religion has historically provided a framework for dealing with guilt, these cultural items may now be filling that void. His pre-sleep activities are, in this sense, treatments for conscience, externalizations of guilt, and resolution. It's interesting to note that in many of these shows and films, the person who solves the crime is the one who was initially suspected. A family member, detective, or newcomer to town is accused of involvement in the crime and the rest of the story cleverly demonstrates that it is someone else who is guilty, not them. Closure can occur when the protagonist's guilt has been removed and the blame for a violent deed has been assigned to someone else. The most common reason for a crime inquiry, as Martha Wolfenstein and Nathan Lates noted in their groundbreaking study of cinema drama, is to clear oneself of a false charge. Some agency, the townsfolk, the local police, invariably accuses the hero of wrongdoing, and the hero must establish his innocence. We'll be able to sleep after the guilt has been reallocated. We may also consider how children may be sent to bed as a punishment. However, their punishment is more closely linked to the time spent not sleeping than to sleep itself. If a parent sends their child out and then discovers them snoozing contentedly a few minutes later, they may feel betrayed. It's not like they're supposed to be able to sleep. 
sleep and a clear conscience collide once more, implying that there is something related to guilt that permits us to sleep and something that prevents us from doing so. Returning to the dairy case, we recall that the patient had a nightly wake hour at 2 a.m., which the analyst diagnosed as a symptom when it was simply a routine occurrence for him. Nonetheless, he had the impression that there was a link between the waking and his childhood past at one point during his study. He recalled his father leaving the house every night to see patients, and when his mother remarried after his death, they teased her that she had picked a newspaper editor who would leave the house every night at the same time. When the young man inquired about his father's missions, his mother confirmed that his father had to leave at 2 a.m. every night to travel to the first aid station where he worked. The analyst then suggested to him that the wake hour may have some connection to the father, and that at specific time kept alive his wrath and his revenge for his sleep being cruelly broken night after night, with the mother failing to protect him from the commotion. The patient agreed, and the rage he had been feeling during the treatment subsided. The wake hour had not been mentioned in a long time, but it would eventually be related to the key symptom that had brought him to analysis in the first place, his concentration problems in his studies. He described studying as a heroic endeavor to stay awake, and he said he would never fall asleep. When questioned why he didn't take short naps if he was so tired, he surprised everyone by saying he was never tired. I always have enough sleep. Despite this, he would have to take cold showers, pinch his nose, and read what he needed to learn aloud. He explained, I can't sleep while I'm supposed to be studying. I get my eight hours of rest every night. If I were to fall asleep throughout the day, I would feel terrible. The analyst then inquired about his father's ability to work throughout the day following his night shifts. And this inquiry triggered a memory. When he went inside his father's office, he discovered him sleeping on a couch. Obviously, he didn't see any patients he concluded. He had married young and taken night work to help support the family. But his day employment was a ruse. There was simply no medical practice. As the son's rage erupted, he expressed his displeasure that after his father had gone out, he was not permitted to join his mother in her bed, as she only wanted to sleep. He would felt absolutely abandoned. It was now evident that his sleeping issues began after his father's death but the 2 a.m. waking would only be confirmed after his mother's remarriage, when it was frequently pointed out that his stepfather left the house at the same time. As his father 2 a.m., it was one of his ways of associating himself with his dead father, a means of indicating to his mother that he was like her husband, at least in this aspect. Derry says, but can't we find another performative dimension in this? As if he's reminding his family of his father's existence which has now been eclipsed by the advent of the new husband. Unlike his less successful father, the stepfather was a well-known newspaper man, an author of many books familiar to the patient's peers. Everyone was suddenly aware of his new father. Perhaps this is all the more reason to remember the old one. The situation was worsened by the boy's growing affection for his stepfather and his desire to emulate him, particularly in writing. In his spare time, he would read books and pretend they were written by his stepfather. He would also plan and create stories while masturbating, and was merely disappointed that most of them were never finished due to sleep deprivation. All of this information did not appear to have any influence on his symptom until later in the analysis, when what he viewed as Derry's irritation with him opened fresh information. His perception of Derry's lack of time for him echoed both his father's displeasure when he visited his office, and his mother's attitude toward his father at night. For the first time in his life, he realized that his father had no desire to go at 2 a.m. His mother would become enraged and push him to do it, chastising him for his aversion. As a condition for his leaving, she would sometimes bribe him with kisses, or have sex with him. This had appeared like a sacrifice to the youngster, and it was these uncanny nights that were causing his nocturnal symptom. He was afraid and enthralled. He loathed to look on and listen, and he couldn't bear to go to sleep, writes Derry. The patient reported for the first time 
that he had slept through the night without waking up during his wake hour after this point. Barry believed that the guilt he would feel if he fell asleep during the day belonged to his wake hour at night, but that it had been relocated so that the night time hour did not seem symptomatic to him. As a result, he was taken aback by the fact that anyone could find it strange. The guilt had migrated from the early morning to the daylight, when he was preoccupied with his schoolwork. Harry is quick to point out that this situation is unusual in many ways, because insomnia rarely has such clear causation, in the sense that it is not the bearer of meaning and history. Many insomnias, on the other hand, do allow for this kind of interpretation, performing a specific role at a certain time or, in other circumstances, progressively acquiring divergent meanings over time and are hence more resistant to therapy. The issue, however, is far from straightforward, and the young man's night waking was the bearer of various strands of his past that had to be unraveled over time. Although it is foolish to view all cases of sleeplessness through Derry's prism, it does offer something that can clarify and illuminate many other cases. We may recall how dreams are constructed here, with day leftovers coupled with unconscious mind trains. Things left undone, what we haven't been able to complete or finish, what we haven't dealt with, what we haven't carried through, or what remains unresolved and interrupted will be the most useful details from our day, what one 18th century physician called the regrets of the day. These are, of course, fundamental aspects of human life, and they gravitate toward our sites of interaction with others as this is where such sensations are frequently formed. We haven't completed a task at work that needs to be viewed by others. We haven't managed to resolve a conflict with another person. We haven't answered to someone's demands. Now, it's these day residues, which are so common and easy to conjure, that function as magnets for the unconscious material, which revolves equally around what hasn't been done, what hasn't been finished, and what hasn't been addressed. The unfinished business of the day, as Freud noticed, has a tenor that is similar to the unconscious's unresolved conflicts and issues. Sins of omission and unfulfilled responsibilities become exaggerated. Perfect analogies for guilt over impulses we may have rejected ourselves. As a result, one guilt makes use of another. The day residues will touch on all that is a debt what we owe or haven't paid, on a level that goes beyond the empirical debts that we may accumulate. This could be a love debt that we feel we haven't fully paid, that we have shirked or avoided doing what we needed to do. Those who can't sleep often report lying awake at night going over their responsibilities, what they should have done, how they should have done or done more for their parents, to the point where sleep becomes impossible. If sleep is perceived as a break, an escape, a suspension of commitments, or, as one insomniac described it, a checking out from my obligations, then, she went on, what right do I have to sleep? How can I forget my responsibilities? Sleep would mean making up for all the wrongs she had accused herself of, most notably her separation from her parents. Perhaps it's no coincidence that we talk about sleep debt an expression that has strangely changed its meaning over time, originally referring to the idea that we spend a third of our lives sleeping in order to pay off debt incurred while awake. It now refers to the debt incurred by not sleeping a third of our lives. In his first work, published in 1923, Claytman argues whether eight hours or more of sleep a day actually constitutes the minimal penalty for remaining awake the remainder of the time as though wakefulness itself is deserving of punishment. There is only one definite way to escape insomnia. Not to be born, Gay Luce and Julius Segel write in their book Insomnia. The act of giving birth creates a debt that many people believe can only be paid after they have children. The patient complained of prolonged and intractable sleeplessness. And after much investigation, it was determined when it first began. He had attended public schools and had secured a spot at a foreign institution following his final examinations. His parents couldn't afford it, 
and there was no place in his home country where he could attend a course in the topic he wanted to study. His parents were supportive of his decision, so his mother took on night shift work to supplement her income and allow her son to continue his education. He finished his degree and established a life in the country where he had relocated. The sleeping problems didn't start until years later, when he learned that his mother had grown ill, what could have been more natural on one level. While he is in another nation, a son learns that his mother is ill. He can't sleep because he's worried about her. This, however, was not what had occurred. First, he wasn't lying awake thinking about her. And second, the sleeplessness didn't start until he returned to see her a few weeks later, when she mentioned that her health problems had started during her night shift employment. The son was unable to sleep at this point. The mother's illness raised the issue of a debt. She had sacrificed her sleep for him, and now the thought of her death brought his responsibilities home. Insomnia was both a symbol of his mother, who labored nights for him, and a form of remuneration. Payback. What right did he have to sleep, after all? In another case, a mother's careless remark would leave an indelible impression on her daughter's sleep for years to come. I didn't sleep for years after the kids were born. She stated during a talk at a family gathering. In all its purity, it was a simple comment. But for her daughter, it meant what right do the children have to sleep. She was painfully aware of her mother's desire for sleep, which she expressed regularly in her remarks as a good night's sleep. And to relate this to her birth was to doom her to a life of insomnia. I wake up with a sensation of guilt, but I don't know what for or for who. A patient said in another case, How do I know it's guilt? I said, and she had no further ideas. I'm not sure, but it is. She connected this to the issue of her maternity in a later session. When she became pregnant, she didn't dare to inform her mother, who had once told her, You don't have to have a kid many years before. There was a guilt there, she said, unsure how her mother would react to the news. I didn't think I'd ever have a child. Her mother's words had been misinterpreted as a demand, and her own maternity had been misinterpreted as a fault or trespass, unintentionally. We could also consider the concept of survivor guilt, which refers to the burden of having survived when someone else has died. Someone may have survived the concentration camps, but their relatives, spouses, children, and parents did not. There is a strong burden of why not me. It has been described by people who have survived the camps numerous times. Survivors of numerous disasters, ranging from vehicle accidents to terrorist assaults, have described how they felt. Isn't it also a sense we get in the absence of obvious tragedy and catastrophe in the bereavements that happen to everyone? When a child stops sleeping when a parent dies, no matter how peaceful or predictable the circumstances, there is typically a sense of guilt about having survived, about not being taken instead. There may be a sense that the parent has sacrificed so much for them, or merely an obligation imposed by birth. But the consequences of this debt should not be overlooked, as if there is a sense of guilt in staying alive, surviving, and separating from those who brought us into the world. Although this is a structural debt that cannot be reduced to anything the person has done, the mere fact of being alive may come to be regarded as a criminal act. Sons and daughters frequently believe that they will get the freedom they desire only when they become parents. Although it is possible that chronic sleeplessness will begin at this point, it would not be judicious to dispute the impact of having a newborn infant on sleep with all the changes that this presents to daytime and nighttime schedules. But isn't there something here in the order of debt as well? We've already mentioned how frequently we hear punishment vocabulary. The parent is being kept awake at night as if to be punished. Just as an infant's sleep problems can be easily attributed to one's own shortcomings. And don't individuals often feel guilty for not brushing their teeth? or removing their makeup for a single night, as if there will be a major repercussion. There is only one thing that will keep me from sleeping, and that is brushing my teeth. As one college student put it, it's not that I worship oral cleanliness 
or have a fear of germs. It's just that I despise the guilt that comes with having dirty teeth. If I try to sleep without brushing my teeth, it takes me longer than normal since I have to focus on forgetting about my teeth rather than carelessly relaxing into a pillow. As the number of bedtime routines grows, the opportunity for omissional sins grows. One of the most popular strategies for falling asleep is counting sheep, which is based on the concept of an omission. Despite the fact that it rarely works, it has become synonymous with the practice of attempting to disengage from waking consciousness. As Wordsworth put it, a flock of sheep calmly passing by, one after another, the sound of rain and bees murmuring, the fall of rivers, winds and seas, smooth fields, white sheets of water, and clear sky. I've thought of all by turns, and yet I lie sleepless. Even if the poet demonstrates the futility of the task, its appeal may be due to the fact that the only actual purpose to count sheep is to see if one has gone missing. Of course, the one who is counting is the one who is liable for the loss. Similarly, the sleep rituals we introduce serve as little dramatizations of reversing this obligation. Whether it's brushing one's teeth, remembering to take a medicine, or putting out the trash, we have a chore that we feel obligated to complete. We go through a pattern to keep danger at away and to give a place that attempts to both open and close the possibility of omission. Like a nightly treatment of guilt, similar to the prayers that were previously such a fundamental component of bedtime. The consequences of disregarding these responsibilities, as stated by the student above, demonstrate how severe the hidden stakes of omission can be. Similarly, just as these duties present activities that can be accomplished, unlike most other elements of our life, they provide a counterbalance or absolution to what we may perceive as avarice or gluttony, a too much. Many people stay awake at night berating themselves for the dessert, sweet snack, or second or third cup of coffee or glass of wine they consumed. As these minor transgressions are repeated and intensified, they come to represent the error we have committed, a fundamental obligation that torments us. Many insomniacs' nighttime thoughts bounce between regrets for what we omitted or failed to accomplish, and regrets for what we did but shouldn't have done. Hilt and blame are nearly always at the center of these conversations about sleep. According to Hartman, acquiring a prescription for sleeping drugs from a doctor can be interpreted as receiving permission from a parent figure who says, it's all right to go to sleep thus granting forgiveness for offenses. And, just as Henry IV in Shakespeare's Henry IV wishes for sleep tossed deep my senses in forgetfulness, so do today's mattresses. Mattress advertisements nearly always deploy blame language. If you aren't sleeping, it's your mattress, while evoking memory foam or mattress memory, as if there is something that has to be remembered. Or, of course, forgotten in order for us to sleep correctly. All of these sleep-related products and processes have a connection to conscience and the topic of guilt on the horizon. Too resentful to sleep. There is more than one form of guilt here, as writers and philosophers recognized long before psychoanalysts. If there is guilt associated with actions we have taken, there is also structural guilt that such actions may attempt to localize and absorb. Rather than being the product of crimes, this is the guilt that causes them. The protagonist in Greek tragedy bears responsibility for deeds that fate has already planned for him. Characters like Agamemnon and Oedipus are destined to suffer the curse of earlier generations in Sophocles or Stea or Theban plays. Tantalus and Laius offspring are both agents and victims of a horrific curse that has afflicted their family bloodline. Although the dramatists broaden and complicate this with problems of individual accountability, there is a basic distinction between what a person does and the matrix in which their acts are set. In their approaches to the issue of guilt, both Freud and Lacan make the same distinction. And initially, Freud considered guilt as a position we might adopt in response to early arousal experiences. At one level, it indicates that we reject a sexual drive 
possibly as a result of a restriction, while at another, it is a type of sexuality, a way of keeping tied to the drive. As a result, many people are unable to establish a sexual relationship unless they are guilty of something. They appear to be more devoted to their guilt than to their lover at times. We can also feel guilty due to a driving tension, a sense of physiological and psychical urgency, and agitation, according to Freud. A desire for fulfillment leads to a sense of guilt. Although Freud stated that he did not believe in unconscious guilt because sentiments are never unconscious, although their origins may be unconscious, the sentiments themselves are always sensed consciously on some level. As a result, he substituted the concept of a necessity for punishment for that certain degree. This caused him to replace the idea of a desire for punishment with that of an unconscious guilt, a finding that aligns with professional practice and the reality that patients rarely express insomnia in their first visits. In terms of the link between prohibition and guilt, Freud would reject this theory as well, and it would be interesting to see how all of his pupils who studied this topic would agree. Although it may seem self-evident that we will feel bad if we breach the law, this is precisely what was debated. Freud discovered the second, more structural kind of guilt in transgenerational interactions. In Totem and Taboo, his just so account of society's beginnings. The sons band together to kill the father and obtain access to the group's women, which the latter had monopolized. However, once the action is completed, they are overtaken with sorrow and now restrict themselves from delivering the same women to whom their act was intended. A transmission of this horrific crime and the remorse that followed it from one generation to the next in human history sets the bounds of a guilt that is not actually the consequence of any particular deed. This was the type of guilt that piqued Lacan's curiosity. He distinguished between guilt resulting from our inscription in family networks, a basic debt we incurred when joining the social world, and the more recent dilemma of being robbed of this burden. The first type of guilt may be found in traditional tragedy, when heroes and heroines must fulfill their destiny at any cost to themselves because of their position in family networks. In some ways, this is an unforgivable and irreversible birth debt. However, removing the concept of destiny may result in a second type of guilt. When the appeal to fate is no longer possible and our predetermined paths are canceled out, Lacan believes we will feel even more responsible. Indeed, we frequently discover that undermining a job, a course of study, or some other life chance is tied to this issue of destiny loss. Being the first person in one's family to attend university, excel in business, or move above a station that they believe is their own might cause symptoms that essentially reverse this. Although our culture pushes us to follow our ambitions and ignore inequitable social hurdles and biases, there might be a high price to pay, as if nothing has given the person the right to take a different path. This is one of the reasons why what society considers to be a success can lead to a melancholy episode or a significant work blunder. In Christopher Nolan's version of Eric S. K. Joldbeard's Norwegian thriller Insomnia, we get a good example of the first type of guilt. Of following a murderer, a detective inadvertently shoots his partner which is fortunate for him because the dead officer was ready to testify against him in an internal affairs probe. The event is assigned to a local cop who is eager to write it off, but the detective insists that she keep the report open. In fact, the shell casing from his own revolver would have established that he fired the fatal shot, not the murderer, as he lies dying at the end of the movie. She shows him the casing she's discovered and offers to throw it away. But he stops her with his last breath. Despite the risk of invalidating his earlier arrests and tarnishing his reputation after his death, the inscription of his responsibility takes precedence. While he has been unable to sleep throughout the film, it is only in the last act that he is able to do so. Unlike the Norwegian version, in which the officer really sets the casing aside, and the detective drives away, 
Nolan emphasizes the ontic dimension of guilt. Knowledge of what had truly happened was more essential than human sentiments of satisfaction. And the desire to protect one's reputation, the symbolic order had to be respected at any cost by insisting that she include the casing in her report. The film's power comes from the terrible collision of two dimensions, the character's contingent lives and the law of the symbolic universe, where guilt cannot be avoided. And, once again, the issue of guilt is connected to a lack of sleep. We could also consider the circumstances in The Postman Always Rings twice at this point. The protagonist, Frank, and his lover, Cora, assassinate the latter's spouse, ostensibly in a vehicle accident. Almost every character, even a cat, is guilty of some type of bigger or minor misdemeanor in the convoluted chain of extortion, misunderstanding, an error that follows, and culpability is continuously shifting from one person to another. Finally, Cora threatens to accuse Frank in the murder, and he admits to considering killing her. She tells him that she is too fatigued to return to shore shortly after this scene, and that if he chooses, he can just leave her there to die. He returns the favor, demonstrating his undying love. Frank loses control of the automobile as they kiss on their way home, and Cora is killed. The authorities misinterpret the accident as a crime, and Frank is sentenced to death. In the closing scene, he passionately asks a priest if Cora might have suspected him of murdering her in the car accident. As if justice and divine retribution are finally being given, the district attorney intervenes to explain that his destiny is punishment not for her death, but for the death of the husband they had slain. Frank will be able to accept his sentence as a result of this. Rather than denying his culpability, he may assume it because he knows he can enter. Only after the record has been made straight can the final sleep be had. Whereas this record was human in insomnia, it is abstract and divine in the postman. Margaret Mead's classic account of sleep patterns in Bali provide a counterexample. She stated that if she returned home and discovered her houseboys sleeping, it was a sure sign that something had been broken or gone stolen. Similarly, persons about to be sentenced on the most serious offenses could often be found soundly resting on the benches in the courthouse. Despite the fact that much of Mead's fieldwork has been questioned, this observation appears to be correct and her findings were confirmed many years later in the 1990s. In contrast to the American concept of coping with a stressful circumstance through wakefulness and attentiveness, she understood these strange siestas as a flight into sleep, as if sleep were a remedy to anxiety. 